sequences that are sensitive and specific for imaging of menisci, ligaments, and articular cartilage, subcondyl bone, and joint fluid. Typical imaging planes are sagittal oblique, coronal, and axial. In sagittal oblique, uh, we uh, try to uh, cover whole ACL length. For this, either we have to uh, tilt the knee, means rotate the knee by 40, 15 degree external rotation, or a knee straight and slices up and parallel to the lateral femoral condyle. <clears throat> In coronal image, the field of view should uh, cover the uh, insertion of the medial collateral ligament into the tibia, which is approximately five to six centimeters from the joint line. In axial images, we have to uh, include quadriceps tendon and patellar insertion. And now the 3D MRI has uh, additional role to um, for this in, uh, resolution of the image <coughs> and reduced imaging time. Because of its high uh, signal to noise ratio, the resolution will be good. So for ACL, we have uh, some additional planes, uh, which, uh, can <coughs> which can give additional advantage on differentiation of the of fibers like uh, anteromedial bundle and posterior medial bundle, posterior lateral bundle, sorry. The typical Im imaging sequences include sagittal, coronal, axial, and if we have 3D sequences, that will be useful for high resolution in plane imaging with additional reconstruction. I'll just describe in brief about menisci, cartilage, and ligaments, what they look, look like in imaging. The cart this menisci, they look uh, low signal intensity in all pulse sequences. And peripherally, they have <coughs> thickness of about four to seven millimeters taper to a thin, sharp inner margin. The zone of the uh, menisci could be uh, divided in zones in adults, like uh, peripheral red zone, red red zone, and uh, mid red white zone, and inner white zone. And there are many, the appearance of the menisci in various imaging, like axial image, they look like C separate structures. In sagittal image, more peripherally, they look like bow tie appearance. And more medially, you go, it will be pointed inner margins. <coughs> uh, coronal image, they look like these triangular structures with sharp margins. The cartilage, poorly demar demarcated identified in MRI, but uh, histologically they have given six zones. The deeper zone is the deeper zone in transitional zone and superficial zone. The orientation of the cartilage affects the thickness, signal intensity, and distinct distinctness of these layers as well. Like if you see here, this uh, area is more high signal than the other areas. It is due to the orientation of the cartilage. Uh, so it is not the ab abnormality. There are few MRI cartilage imaging pitfalls like magnetic magic angle artifact, partial volume averaging, chemical shift artifact, susceptibility artifact. These are all things we have to consider and find out whether it is due to artifact or is it real pathology. To, uh, <coughs> to define it, uh, we can use further imaging like orthogonal planes and other imaging as well. So ligaments, they look also low signal intensity in all all sequences. Now, for reading the images, we can start from coronal, sagittal, or axial. Any, uh, we can start from any plane, but uh, for easiness, we, we usually use this um, uh, sequence. Coronal T1 or PD with coronal PD fat set will give bone marrow abnormality, any fracture, and along with that, fluid, ligaments, menisci, and tibiofemoral cartilage we can see. In sagittal image, we mostly focus on extensor mechanism, patellofemoral cartilage, and medial and lateral compartment cruciate ligaments. In axial image, again, patellofemoral cartilage and extensor mechanism and ligaments. So now I will um, read the sequences uh, uh, in uh, sequences here. These are the coronal PD fat suppressed images of a uh, knee joint from front to backwards, anterior to posterior. We see anterior, most uh, image will show you extensor mechanisms here. This uh, patella, quadriceps tendon and patellar tendon. More posteriorly, we will see the insertion of the root of medial meniscus. And there is insertion of the uh, iliotibial band 
into the anterolateral aspect of the uh, tibia that is guard is tubercle. More posteriorly, we will see an attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament and uh, uh, root attachment of the lateral meniscus. At this plane, we can also demonstrate this medial collateral ligament, which is a very thin structure, and uh, also um, triangular structure of the menisci here, lateral meniscus and medial meniscus as well. In this plane, we can uh, uh, evaluate the weight bearing surface of the cartilage uh, of femur and tibia plateau also. And going more posteriorly, we can see the attachment, root at attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament to the medial uh, femoral condyle and anterior cruciate ligament to the lateral femoral condyle. Also, at this image more posteriorly, we can see the attachment of the uh, popliteus tendon uh, in posterior lateral aspect of the femoral lateral femoral condyle. More posteriorly we go, we will uh, we see the lateral collateral ligament insertion into the lateral femoral condyle and biceps femoris tendon attachment to the fibular head. In this image, um, in the posterior aspect, we can see the root attachment of the medial and the lateral uh, menisci here. So next we evaluate the coronal sagittal images. I start from lateral to medial. More um, far lateral image will show the insertion of the conjoint tendon. This is lateral collateral ligament and um, biceps femoris tendon. They are attached to the um, fibular head. More medially you go, there is bow tie appearance of the lateral meniscus. And uh, there is uh, posteri posteriorly, uh, the popliteus tendon is seen, uh, and these fascicles are here, popliteal meniscal fascicles. One is posterior superior, and one is anterior inferior fascicles are seen. At this level, we can clearly see the cartilage of the femoral condyle, like this weight bearing, this posterior non-weight bearing, and this trochlear cartilage as well, and also patellar cartilage. This extensor mechanism is also seen in this image, and this uh, um, triangular structure of the lateral menisci here, and insertion of the uh, this uh, lateral gastrocnemius tendon. More medial, you will see the root attachment of the um, lateral menisci, posterior root attachment and anterior root attachment here. Then in this image, to uh, evaluate the fat pads, like this is a fast fat pad, vertices fat pad, peripheral fat pad, and this extensor mechanism. And in the center portion, we see the, we evaluate here the anterior cruciate ligament, deeper than the, this blue man set line of the intercondylar nodes. And mm, the attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament in the posterior aspect of the tibia is seen here. And <clears throat> more posteriorly, more medial, in this region, we also see the, this uh, root attachment of the medial meniscus is posterior root and anterior root. And more medially, we see the cartilage of the medial moral condyle and tibial plateau and insertion of the gastro medial head of gastronomous posterior aspect of the distal femur. And more medially, in the me posterior medial corner, this is the menisco capsular junction. We evaluate it here whether there is any separation and cartilage posterior, non weight bearing cartilage, and weight bearing cartilage also here. And this more posterior medially, we can see this uh, semi membranosus tendon, and this is semi tendinosus and other gracilis and sartorius not visualized in this in sequence. And in the axial image, we can start from distal to proximal. In distal most image, we often ev we evaluate this uh, proximal tibia fibular joint with anterior and posterior um, ligaments. And anterior lateral aspect, there is uh, insertion of the iliotibial guard tubercle and extensor mechanism here, Hofas fat pad. And in we go, there is insertion of the medial collateral ligament. And here is uh, gas, uh, sartorius, gas, uh, gracilis, and semi tendinosus, this semi membranous tendon here. Then there is insertion of the, this posterior cruciate ligament in the midline posterior here. And in the, at the level of the joint, uh, we see uh, articular, this uh, menisci, lat medial and lateral menisci and intermenisci ligament anterior here. Again, the same thing, lateral collateral ligament, biceps femoris tendon, their medial collateral ligament. Coming super proximally, we see the uh, anterior cruciate ligament 
posterior cruciate ligament in intercondylar nodes in midline, and more proximally, there is attachment of the um, posterior cruciate ligament into the medial femoral condyle and anterior cruciate ligament into the and, uh, femoral condyle. Again, we see here thin medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament, this uh, extensor mechanism, uh, this, sorry, this uh, um, retinaculum, this uh, lateral and medial. And uh, now proximal at the level of the patellofemoral joint, we have to, we see the whole length of the patellar cartilage and trochlear. This is best view for uh, evaluation of the patellofemoral uh, articular cartilage. And more proximally, we see here this uh, quadriceps tendon, quadriceps fat pad, peripheral fat pad, and uh, other vasti muscles here. Mm. So I have almost completed the areas where we have to see for this uh, evaluation of whole knee as a whole, mainly P proton density fat suppressed or T2 fat suppressed images are best for evaluation of the, uh, these cartilage, menisci and ligaments. All of the added advantage of uh, any ED images. So um, for further uh, imaging, we can have this MR advances, few advances are here. For, yeah, Future direction, physiological imaging is added here uh, for advantage of these surgical procedures like cart cartilage implants, medical, medial meniscal repair, prevention, arthritis progression, or pharmacological therapies. So further imaging with T T1 row imaging, sodium MRI, diffusion MRI are also coming along with the T2 mapping for the cartilage. So that concludes my brief presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Ishudai, do you want to say something? Hey, on mute, please. Yeah. Ishudai. Yes. Uh, do you want to say something? I think there's oh, no... Uh, yes. I think uh, uh, let's have the discussion at the end so that uh, we can have a better time and uh, do it at the end. Okay? We then get... Um, uh, we'd like Amit to... I think that's the second presentation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yubraj. Um, can I request uh, Dr. Amit to continue with his presentation? And... Uh, am, I, am I visible and audible? Yes, sir. Not audible and visible, Amit. Okay, thank you very much, Yuvraj. That was excellent and a very uh, brief talk on uh, basics, uh, the normal anatomy of uh, uh, all the knee structures. Uh, uh, that was excellent. I have some question that will come after my presentation. So, sure, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, if if everybody can mute because I'm not able to. Okay, so so what I'm going to talk uh, now is. Uh, the clinician's perspective of uh, knee MRI. So at the very outset, uh, let me uh, disclose that uh, uh, this is a purely clinical perspective and uh, I'm talking my personal experience of last 15 years of knee surgeries. Uh, before I go to my formal presentation, uh, there is a poll question. Uh, Vivek, can you put up this poll, please? The first question. So is clinical examination more sensitive than MRI for meniscus and ligament injury uh, of the knee? So can you please vote all the attendees? I can see about 50 participants. Can you vote that? So what is your opinion on uh, clinical examination and MRI? So is clinical examination more sensitive than MRI or you think that MRI is more sensitive than clinical examination? Okay, Vivek, can, can we see the, can you end the poll and see the results, please? Okay, so 50% think that uh, uh, clinical examination is more sensitive and 
So another 50% they think that probably uh, not clinical examination. Okay, uh, can you stop this poll? I'll go ahead with my presentation. So, uh, uh, so I absolutely, uh, let me take the laser also, okay. So 50% of these people are absolutely correct. If you see, uh, this is a 2015 uh, paper from KSSTA, uh, which says that diagnostic accuracy of clinical test for all ACL, PCL, MCL, and LCL is above 90%, provided it is done by a very good clinician. Another paper from very recent paper from 2020 uh, from the journal uh, uh, advanced orthopedics, which says that clinical examination performed by an experienced examiner can have equal or even more diagnostic accuracy compared to MRI to evaluate the meniscus lesion. So if you see these two papers, which says that for ligaments also, clinical examination is very good at par with the MRI or even better with, than the MRI. For the meniscus also, it is equally good or even better than the MRI. So if the clinical examination is very good, then why we need a, why we need, a, why the clinician need an MRI? It is not actually to diagnose the condition. Clinically, these are usually diagnosed. So for clinicians, uh, the MRI is required for three uh, main purpose. These are patient perspective. In my practice, most of these patients, they come with uh, the MRI or these patients feel more comfortable when uh, MRI is done uh, for their knee uh, injuries. And the counseling of these patients becomes much easier if they have MRI uh, done prior to the surgery. The second and one of the important issue that is coming up uh, at this moment is the uh, medical legal and the insurance is issues. Uh, so many of the insurance companies that is existing in our part of the world, they do not uh, refund or reimburse the money until unless MRI proven uh, pathology of the knee has been done. So for insurance purpose, it is very, very essential. And for the medical legal as well, if something goes wrong uh, in the knee joint, so probably a medical legal issue is also very, very important. The MRI is important for that reason. But for me as a clinician, a surgical perspective is very important because this is a picture of three different patients, uh, the sagittal section of the same um, of the knees. And then you can see that all these tears have been reported at ACL tear. So for a radiologist, these are ACL tear. These are complete ACL tear. For, but for a clinician perspective, these are completely different issues. These are completely different ACL tear. In the first picture, you can see that the good amount of the remnant is preserved. So my surgical planning is completely different. This is a chronic case in which you can see that the remnant has gone and attached to the, to the TBL plateau. So uh, the planning or the surgical planning is different. And this is the third case, which is usually an, uh, this is an acute tear in which you can see that a very small amount of good remnant there is a tethering of these part of the remnant. So the treatment is going to be completely different. So for a radiologist, all these three pictures can be of the ACL tear, but for a clinician, this is a completely different types of ACL tear, which will have different bearing in the planning and the management of the ACL injury. So another picture, just to, um, just to emphasize on the same fact that these are the meniscal tears are different, completely different meniscal tear. So many of the radiologists, they can just report that there is a meniscal tear, medial meniscus tear, but these are completely different for a, from the surgical point of view. For us, this is a complex tear. This is a completely peripheral tear, which is very much amenable repair probably. So my counseling, my planning for surgery will be completely different in this case compared to this case and that case. And this is a double PCL sign, which is very much classic for displaced bucket handle tear. And in this particular case, it will be completely different. So the first point I would like to make is that the clinician should learn to read MRI by themselves. This is not to undermine the quality and the capability of our radiological colleagues, but 
the same tear which has been reported by a radiologist means a lot and means completely different for us so that is why probably all the clinicians which is, who is practicing knee surgery they must read their mri themselves and make their impression by themselves if their impression differs from the radiological difference then there is a point that you have to talk to your radiologist and find out a common consensus when there is a radiological report and then you are going to do a arthroscopy so there may be some time mismatch so if it is a positive uh, probably it is not a problem even if it is a false positive that means a radiologist have reported a tear but when you go into arthroscopy there is no tear this will not make a significant difference but false negative that means there is a no tear reported by the radiologist and in arthroscopy when you go inside you will find out that there is a tear this is a place when you are in a thick soup and you are in a problem and this will give uh, this false negative cases will give a problem so when there is a false negative case there are two basic issues these are the counseling issues for uh, for me as a clinician that i have not counseled that patient for a particular surgery that is additional to the surgery that i have advised for example a patient of acl tear which is not reported uh, meniscal tear is not reported in his mri but you go inside and find out that there is a meniscal tear associated with which requires a surgery which will change his uh, rehabilitation plan which will change his recovery duration which will change everything about the rehabilitation and probably the patient is not going to be happy after the surgery when you say that now you are not going to wait there for 6 weeks you are not going to move your knees for this time another important uh, point uh, as a clinician i have to face when there is a false negative cases is the financial issues because when you supplement another extra surgery that will require implant instruments thread or whatever surgical surgical procedure it will incur certain financial issues as well so that you have not counseled your patient and when after the surgery you say that i have repaired your meniscus but you are going to pay 50000 more for that the patient is not going to be happy so my second uh, point as a clinician is when there is a clinical radiological mismatch talk to your radiologist if there is a symptoms and the report mismatch if your report and the radiological report mismatch if the clinical finding and the radiological report mismatch this is a point when you have to talk to radiologist there is no need to go to the radiologist who have reported initially you can talk to your own radiologist with whom you are comfortable with and come up with the uh, final conclusion so that you can manage a perfect treatment plan for that particular patient here i'd like to show very important uh, and the um, uh, uh, studies uh, of this is of 2015 a systematic review of level 2 and the level 1 studies in which they have done a meta analysis of diagnostic accuracy of mri for suspected acl and the meniscal tear so if you see uh, for medial meniscus tear this is above 90 the sensitivity of mri is above 90 for lateral meniscus this is little low which is around 80% so for lateral meniscus sensitivity of mri is lower than the medial meniscus and as as you all know that acl is one of the gold standard mri is one of the gold standard and its sensitivity for acl tear is above 95% this is another study which i would like to bring to your uh, notice that this uh, paper concludes that a trained radiologist obtains better sensitivity specificity and accuracy in the diagnosis so in nepal we all know that we have paucity of msk radiologist uh, in our context so this is my second poll question uh, vivek can you put this second poll question uh, ahead please so do you think uh, both radiologist and clinician do you think that mri is equally accurate in our context compared to the european context keeping in mind that we have very less amount of the uh, expert radiologist
So I can see about 40 odd people have already voted. 40 people. Uh, Vivek, can you, can you stop uh, poll now and show the result, please? Okay, so 60, about 60% 60 they think that uh, uh, MRI is not uh, as good as uh, the, the sensitivity of MRI is not good as good as the European um, reports. Okay, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Vivek, for sharing. Uh, okay, can you just, just remove this? Vivek, can you, can you remove the, uh, the poll, please? Uh, I have already removed, sir. Is it still showing? Uh, it is uh, shown. Okay. Let me stop sharing. No, it was, uh, what did you do? Stop okay. sharing. Share it. No, it's still visible in my, uh, this thing. Okay, wait, don't do anything. I'll stop from here. Okay, somehow it is showing in my slide. It is not remove going off. Uh, Is it gone, sir? No, it is still visible in my slide. No, it's not gone. Oh. First, first share result, Vivek. Share result and just remove this. Okay, then now you do a stop sharing. Oh my God. Still showing, sir? Yes, oh. still visible. Oh. Okay, let me do something. I think you can you can keep it in this side or minimize it. Okay, I've done that. Fine. So uh, this is uh, we also thought that uh, probably uh, since we have paucity of the uh, musculoskeletal radiologist and then ninety percent of our MRI were reported earlier by a general uh, radiologist, we also thought that probably. Our uh, radiological reports, our MRI reports are not as good as reported by the European standard, which is usually with the musculoskeletal radiologist. But to our utter surprise, if you see, this is analysis of 234 cases of last one year that we have done in our um, center. You see that for ACL sensitivity is very good, about 85%. For PCL, it is less uh, compared to the uh, other published um, uh, data uh, for uh, uh, for uh, medial meniscus it is about 90% and for lateral meniscus it is about 84%. I'll come to root ramp and the cartilage a little later but if you consider these amount of sensitivity 85 and above sensitivity for all this structure uh, probably our radiologists are doing a very fantastic job uh, the general radiologists are doing a very fantastic job to get this amount of sensitivity and specificity. But when we went to a subgroup analysis of our ACL tier, what we found that the partial tier when the radiologist reports, then you have to be a little careful, uh, be careful of as a clinician. So out of 23 uh, of 234 cases, 23 uh, had a partial reported as a partial tier. And out of these 23, 18 had actually a complete ACL tear. So this says that when there is a partial tear reported by a radiologist, then we as a clinician have to be little bit cautious. And what we analyzed that when they report a partial tear, there was a good amount of remnant. So this was a case uh, example in which it was reported as a partial tear because a good amount of remnant was visible in this particular case. So this patient was actually reported as a partial tear. So we found that probably the remnant, the large amount of remnant get confused with the partial tear. That is why this is a paper which is still uh, considered for the final publication in the Journal of Knee, in which we have proposed that uh, ACL Blumensat line is a very good indicator of detecting either this ACL is adequately tensioned or this is a remnant of a torn ACL. So in the same case, if the apex of this ACL Blumen set line is towards the femur, you can see that the yellow color is the Blumen set line. The red color is from the anterior fiber of the, uh, the ACL visible in the MRI. If it meets at towards the femur, then it is intact. In this case, it was meeting towards the tibia, which indicates that it is a torn. 
sometime in very few cases we have found a parallel these lines are parallel these are the cases in which we have to be very accurate uh, supplement with the clinical diagnosis uh, to come to a uh, uh, the final diagnosis so the third point i would like to make that clinician have to be clinicians have to be very careful if mri reports as a partial tear of the acl me as a clinician partial tear of acl is extremely rare condition uh, in our uh, review of about 500 650 cases we have seen only 17 cases of par true partial tear so these partial tear when it is reported by the radiologist i become very much conscious do a thorough clinical examination and correlate and re go to my uh, radiologist and identify what is the exact pathology coming to the root ramp and cartilage injuries unfortunately the sensitivity specificity of root ramp and the cartilage lesions the sensitivity and the positive predictive value is very very low although the world literature also say that the sensitivity of mri for root ramp and the cartilage lesion is less than the acl and the pcls but this is much lower than the than the european literature or the american literature we have to look at it when there is a root and ramp and the cartilage lesion uh, my humble request to all the radiologists to look at these findings which is not been published it is still in a process of publication but the but the sensitivity of the mri for root ramp and the cartilage lesion is extremely low so i as a clinician a uh, root tear is is now very well studied at this moment if you talk about 5 years before till date before this date nobody used to diagnose a root tear it used to go completely unnoticed now we have very well studied a uh, few signs the ghost signs the ghost sign is if you see that the meniscus is uh, visible in this cut it is less visible in this cut but in this case the anterior root is still visible but the posterior root is not visible so it has disappeared that is known as a ghost sign uh, the cleavage sign which is visible in the coronal cut uh, this is a coronal cut in which there has to be a continuum of the root of the meniscus to the tibial plateau but there is a cleavage which is known as a cleavage sign and a very important indirect sign is the extrusion of the meniscus in these cuts you can see that if you compare with the lateral meniscus the medial meniscus are extruded so if you consider these three points and the clinical picture the typical clinical presentation of the patient of root tear probably the diagnosing a root is not very difficult ramp is also known as a hidden reason uh, and the the diagnosis of ramp is extremely low by mri in various studies although there are some study which says that about 84% of the ramp lesion can be identified in our experience of 650 cases sorry 234 cases that we have analyzed there were five ramp lesion and unfortunately only one out of five ramp lesion were reported on mri remaining four uh, ramp lesions are diagnosed intraoperatively when we do a modified gilquist maneuver and go into the posterior medial compartment so ramp lesion still remains a very much undiagnosed by the mri in our context probably the the frequent flow of information the newer uh, radiological sequences to identify the ramp lesion will be helpful for us and as well for our radiologists to identify the ramp lesion so the fourth point i would like to make here uh, as a clinician is the mri is the effective uh, mri is less effective for root and ramp lesion a clinical assessment is very very important someone who is having a high grade pivot shift test has a, a grade 3 uh, lackman test or anterior drawer test probably these are the patient in which root and ramp lesions are very much associated and we have to be very meticulous to look at these uh, features another very important findings that i would like to share as a clinician that in there are many study which says that the sensitivity of mri for meniscus tear is less in acl deficient knee so what i mean to say that if if you compare the mri of patients who have acl tear and patients who do not have acl tear 
the sensitivity if you compare this is our there are a lot of paper this is our analysis of uh, uh, 234 patient which says that those patients who have acl tear the sensitivity of medial meniscus is 88% compared to 94% sensitivity in case of acl intact group so it is significantly less if you go down and see that lateral meniscus is amazingly lower sensitivity of mri compared to the compared to the those who have intact acl similarly if you compare root cartilage and the ramp lesion the sensitivity of all these structure associated injuries along with the acl is extremely low so whenever there is a acl tear associated we have to be very careful of these associated injury which is very less sensitive to the mri as well so this is a subgroup analysis of the lateral meniscus only if you see the uh, sensitivity of the lateral meniscus uh, is only 50% in ACL deficient group and in ACL intact group, it is 80%. Detail because of various reason, uh, these uh, meniscus tear are missed if it is associated with the ACL injuries. Uh, so because of that, uh, we have come up with the, with the concept of a, a predictive scoring system for meniscal tear through the, signi in, through the significant instability definition and this is the paper that we have published in 2019 in orthopedic journal of sports medicine and in this paper we have come up with the conclusion that uh, if someone who has more than three score according to this pssi scoring system these people will have higher chance of meniscal tear and this is uh, higher than the normal sensitivity of the of the mri so probably in those patients who have associated ACL tear and you are suspecting some associated condition, probably there is a point to use a, this predictive scoring system. So the fifth point I would like to make is efficacy of MRI significantly decreases for meniscal tear in ACL injured knee. So in these cases, probably we have to be more cautious about diagnosing the conditions of meniscus and the cartilage. The finally, I, I would like to share a very interesting case where we've burnt our finger. This was a 52-year-old uh, active gentleman. He was a very active. He was playing sports and doing everything. He was a relative of a doctor and referred to me uh, with a history of uh, twisting knee uh, followed by swelling. About five months back, he had mechanical symptom of uh, mechanical symptom of catching and locking pain. Uh, he had and he also had occasional giving way. He was actually referred to me with the MRI diagnosis of complete ACL tear. And he was uh, referred to me by one of my orthopedic colleague for ACL reconstruction. And this was his MRI report, which reported that there is a complete thickness tear of the anterior cruciate ligament, and there is a complex tear of the medial meniscus. This was his uh, MRI in which, in fact, you can see that there is a complex, there is a radial component, there is a horizontal component of the medial meniscus tear. Uh, uh, but when we saw uh, the societal cut, we saw that uh, he had some fibers going on <coughs> up above. This was almost parallel to the ACL Blumen set line. So there was a mismatch. Uh, and then this is his clinical picture. This is not an OPD picture. This was pre-operative picture, which I would like to show, which says that there was no ACL tear. He had a grade two effusion. Uh, there was no cross fluctuation test. Uh, the valgus and the varus test were negative, both in extension as well as in the flexion. The Lackman test, test was negative. He had a rock solid hard in point. So we got carried away with the report that there was an ACL tear. We counseled the patient that clinically this was not an ACL tear, uh, but you have a meniscal tear. So we thought that a meniscectomy, since the patient had a mechanical symptom, probably a meniscectomy will help. And as a clinician, uh, I was uh, denying the report given by the radiologist. So I was very much happy. And the, we went for the surgery. You can see that anterior drawer test negative. Uh, the MacBurry's test was positive. And so his ligaments were perfectly normal in the clinical examination. 
So we went ahead with the arthroscopy. This is uh, his arthroscopic picture. Uh, this is I'm going into the medial gutter. This is the medial gutter and into the medial compartment. So as soon as we went into the medial compartment, we saw a huge cartilage defect. So this is a degenerative grade four cartilage defect in the femur. And there is a cartilage diffuse cartilage defect, both in the femur as well as in the tibia. And there was a lots of effusion. And you could see that there was a complex tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And this was probably the cause of the uh, his mechanical symptom, locking, catching, and you can see that the cartilage defect. Uh, his ACL was absolutely normal. In a while, I'll show you the ACL. The ACL was absolutely normal, little bulky, devoid of the synovium, which says that little bit of uh, mucoid degeneration going on. You can see a little bit of cyst of the mucoid uh, in the tibial attachment. And if you go into the lateral compartment, the lateral compartment is completely pristine. So you can see that the meniscus was intact, the femoral cartilage, this is in the lateral compartment, and the meniscus was intact throughout. The cartilage is pristine on the lateral side, both in the femur as well as in the tibia. So this patient had actually intact ACL. So we did a arthroscopy, arthroscopic debridement of the joint, meniscectomy. Uh, but the patient remained unhappy even after the surgery. He, his mechanical symptoms have gone because the torn meniscus, which was giving a locking feature, have gone. But he still had a pain while walking and he was having swelling and the patient was come absolutely not happy. On, on, on top of that, the patient was relative of uh, one of our orthopedic colleague. So we tried a conservative management medications uh, and the physiotherapy, which failed. My friend, uh, Dr. Nagmani Singh, uh, he gave a PRP into the joint twice. Again, that failed and the patient was not happy. When we went retrospectively, what went wrong with this patient? Then when we went retrospectively, we saw his x-ray in which you can see that there is a gross osteoarthritis of the medial compartment. Now, if you go to the MRI picture, which is very much matches with the picture of this x-ray. Again, retrospectively going to the MRI, we got carried away only with the meniscus. We didn't read the cartilage. And even the radiologists, they did not mention about the cartilage. Now, if you see, there is a gross destruction of the cartilage here, uh, both in the femoral as well as in the tibial side. And of course, there is a blunting of the meniscus, which says that there was a tear of the meniscus. <clears throat> so then we did a stitch scanogram of this patient. You can see the stitch scanogram in the right side compared to the left side, the patient is having varus on the right left side as well, but it was more prominent on the right side. And when we counsel the patient for probably the earlier surgery will, wouldn't have, will not uh, last for a very long time. You need a bone surgery to correct the alignment. The patient was very much unhappy and say that probably the previous surgery went in vain. All my money was not very much useful that I gave it to you. So, uh, uh, why the treatment failed when we retrospectively analyze it is not the treatment failed but actually we failed to identify the correct treatment of this patient we missed to evaluate the mri the cartilage part we did not evaluate uh, properly uh, the x-ray was completely ignored in this particular patient because we got carried away with the with the mri report the dramatic uh, clinical uh, opposition so probably this was missed So the sixth point here, I would like to make that clinical evaluation has to be thorough and treatment has to be instituted based on clinical judgment rather than the MRI alone. Do not ever go by the MRI report alone and institute a treatment for this patient. And a judicious use of X-ray has to be performed. So with this, I'd like to summarize uh, my uh, opinion of a clinician as far as the MRI is concerned is by saying that the clinician should learn to read MRI by themselves because the tear uh, reported by a radiologist means completely different for a clinician. When there is a clinical radiological mismatch, talk to your radiologist before deciding what treatment will be suitable for that particular patient. Clinicians have to be very careful if MRI report uh, the reporter reports as a partial tear of the ACL. Partial tear is extremely rare and most of the time big 
remnant are reported as a partial tear. So we have to be very, very careful of. MRI is less effective for root and ramp lesion. So at this moment, root and ramp lesion are clinical diagnosis for us. And there has to be a high degree of suspicion in certain uh, cases. Efficacy of MRI significantly decreases for meniscus in ACL injured knee. So ACL injury is the most commonly performed surgery by the knee surgeon. Unfortunately, the efficacy of MRI for meniscus in case of ACL injured knee is very, very low. So if our radiologists also understand this, this point, they'll be more careful. We as a clinician, we have to be more careful when we read the MRI with the ACL injury. And we have to be judicious of X-ray X-ray reading. So till date, I've been finding that X-ray is not very uh, valuable for the decision making, but now it has completely changed. X-ray is very, very important for the decision making of a knee surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation of the clinical's perspective of not just reading MRI, but correlating your clinical finding and your MRI finding. Uh, the first two uh, summary are given by Amit. You know, you should be able to learn. If you are not, you should learn to do your MRI reading yourself. And whenever there is a, pro a problem, there is a mismatch between your clinical finding and your MRI a report that it's a very good idea and it is very necessary that you go and talk with your MRI or your radiologist to clear that out. And all those other uh, points that Amit uh, put out was very, very re relative and very, very important. Uh, so uh, I think we should go along with our second next presentation. And then are there, there are some questions there in the chat box. I yeah, think, there, uh, there is one question by Dr. Sanjeev Rizal. He is asking, how often we get posterior medial tibial bruise on ramp lesion? Okay. Uh, if if uh, this question is to me, um, uh, yes, sir. radiologist will also answer. I, I can tell only the clinical um, aspect of the ramp lesion. Ramp lesion uh, can occur in acute as well as in the chronic stages. If you get an MRI done within six weeks, then you can see the bruises. If you don't get the MRI within six weeks, then the bruises will not be visible. So there is a more so reason why you have to do your MRI as early as possible or as soon as the patient is fit to go MRI because there are so many secondary signs that can be seen in, in MRI. But if the MRI is done after six weeks, the bruises will not be there. Uh, the bruises are very uh, small amount of bruise and there are very typ typical distribution as you Sanjeev mentioned. Uh, but these bruises are associated with the ramp lesion only in case of acute um, uh, conditions. If it is a chronic ACL tear, there is a gradual tearing of the ramp lesion, then in those cases, the bruises will not be available. And acute ramp lesion is very uncommon compared to a chronic uh, associated with the chronic ACL injury. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have one question to you. Uh, why there is so much of less uh, sensitivity and specificity in MRI findings of meniscus tear and other thing when there is an ACL deficit knee rather than an ACL intact knee? Amit, you have to unmute. Uh, a, a very interesting question uh, of which uh, there is no clear cut. Uh, answer at this moment, but there are a lot of literature. One of, one of the things um, that um, uh, Yuvraj was also saying, there are various uh, uh, angle artifacts. So your meniscus, uh, posterior part of the meniscus is curved. And because <coughs> of this curved uh, nature of the uh, meniscus, the, anterior, uh, the curve artifacts are very much uh, evident. Uh, that may be one of the reasons. Uh, that is why the lateral meniscus, which is more curved, you know, compared to the medial meniscus, is less sensitive to MRI than the medial meniscus. Uh, other reason is uh, being mentioned that those people in which uh, the ACL is subluxed anteriorly, the tibia is brought anteriorly, and there is a rotation because of the tear of the ACL, and this creates uh, the normal um, the angle at which we take MRI will not pick it up. So there, that is why there are so many other sequences uh, have been mentioned. 
and there are so many good amount of reasons probably yuvraj can also highlight on that there are so many other reasons also uh, that has been mentioned by uh, with the acl tier this is less picked up by the okay. sir thank you sir there are two more questions one by dr sunil pant how often hemarthrosis hampers mri findings uh, uh so i think we can take these questions in uh, panel discussion because i have some questions uh, relating to all acute and chronic settings uh, i think we should go on with the panel discussion is one, it okay sir yeah uh, i i have a few question to yuvraj because that may not come in your panel if it comes in your panel discussion we can do so yuvraj what is the okay. thickness of the slice that you take when you do a normal uh, mri of the knee yes sir thank you for the question the thickness of the uh, they take around 2.5 mm thickness and in spiral uh, nowadays with 3.3 tesla mri the uh, there will less chance of missing anything so with 1.5 tesla mri also we have this 2.5 uh, millimeter thickness less chance of missing the lesion sir yeah i i i agree yuvraj but uh, if you go to recently we have been lot of doing a li literature search and there are lot of uh, comparison between 1.5 and the 3 tesla mri and most of these literature they say that they say that for cartilage there may be there may be slight advantage of the 3 tesla mri for detecting a cartilage defect or the cartilage injury but for the meniscus 3 uh, tesla mri compared to the 1.5 tesla they do not have that significant amount of the advantage probably in uh, in that thing we can come so yuvraj would you like to add on why in acl tier the sensitivity of mri is less than the acl intact uh, group of people i have no exact answer sir but sometimes it could be sat satisfaction of sorts also maybe i'm not sure but uh, if there even if there is acl tier we should be able to find out the lateral meniscus tear hey, dr okay, yuvraj but... just add it on, on to me you talked about uh, getting that uh, for a knee mri you have to have that uh, dedicated kind of coil reader yes sir and uh, and for a uh, normal mri if you if you do an mri of the spine or or the body you have that big one you know where you put the patient does that really make a difference getting a, what do you call that the knee coil thank you sir yes this uh, dedicated uh, coils are very important to get the high resolution imaging if we put body coil into the knee or other extremity structures the image will not be good the resolution will not be that good so we need it dedicated coils for particular organs like for knee this is like there and some wrist we have wrist coils for extremities we have extremity coils sir so they do make a uh, make a difference in the sensitivity and the specificity yes definitely there is uh, some difference with the reporting because with a dedicated coil we'll get uh, exact uh, uh, amount of defects there will no blurring no blurring and resolution will be high thank you resolution thank you i think we should go on with our uh, talk we uh, still uh, have yes, two people would, uh, sir yes, i just like to add some point that was erased from our study which is going to be published that when we yes. did analysis of these uh, 234 mris uh, this was coming from all over the country reported by randomly reported by uh, radiologist of all over the country we also uh, uh, recorded the orthopedicians uh, finding at the same time so we compared uh, the orthopedicians report with the radiologist report we thought that probably we should be better in reporting these mri because we know the clinical findings which probably most of the radiologists will not know uh, that is why that was the whole purpose of uh, making this research unfortunately we found that the sensitivity of mri reported by a orthopedic surgeon who is a knee surgeon uh, or a fellow is not better than the uh, better than the radiologist so probably uh, there are something else that we need to explore uh, why the sensitivity is uh, not less compared to the european and the american papers 
it's uh, it is not less uh, to congratulate our uh, radiologists who are not all are not uh, you know musculoskeletal radiologists but these are pretty good uh, that is what i want to say so there was a there was a thought process in my mind that i have been reading my mri myself i know the clinical signs and symptoms probably i'll better detect all these injury for my patient but unfortunately this was not right so we are at par with our radiologist yes please okay, vivek thank you mr yeah we still have two question but we we will deal with that later on uh, can we have the next speaker please vivek okay sir uh, this will be the panel discussion sir i'm going to share okay. my screen uh, okay is my slides visible sir yes yes okay uh, so this will be a panel discussion on uh, how to read knee mri uh, i will try to cover many of the basics and i will try to touch some of the advances uh, advanced things about the mri of knee uh, so give me some minute i'll change this settings uh, I need your panel. Okay. So let's start. So, <clears throat> uh, respected seniors, colleagues, and my juniors, uh, today I'm going to. Uh, we are going to have a panel discussion on how to read MRI. MRI reading will be covering some basics and advances. Uh, this is a little different panel discussion than the panel discussion which we used to uh, do in the past because we have uh, the, in the panelists we have eminent uh, knee surgeons, uh, eminent surgeons like Professor Amit Joshi and Dr. Sudipman Baide, and we have very young dynamic uh, radiologist colleagues, uh, um, Dr. Yuvraj from BNB Hospital. He is a uh, MSK fellow, MSK radiology fellow, and Dr. Sundar Suwal from uh, TUTS Maharajganj. He is an assistant professor there. So both the clinician, we will be discussing about the clinical and the radiological perspective of the uh, MRI knee in our panel discussion today. I'm Dr. Vivek Basukala. I myself, along with uh, Dr. Sunil Singh Thapa, will be moderating this session. So. MRI, the radiological whole history of the radiology started with this existential horror image of the hand of the uh, uh, wife of Dr. Ronjan. This was the picture, extra image of the picture of uh, the wife of Dr. Ronjan. And this, the, the first sentence what uh, Mrs. Ronjan uh, uttered was, I have seen my death. So this was the start of the era of radiology. Then after there was massive progress in uh, field of ra uh, radiology and MRI is the uh, thing which has progressed a lot. So there has been many Nobel prizes uh, in uh, MRI, in the research of MRI. So MRI is very, very important test. And this is left side image is the image of cord section of the knee joint and the right side is the uh, same knee in uh, which is seen in the MRI. So MRI gives vivid picture of the anatomy of the any structure of the knee, any structure of the body. So MRI is very important investigation and very good investigation. So we'll be discussing about it. Whenever we do MRI as a clinician, what we think about is we are going to see about the meniscus. We like to see the intactness of the ligaments and with the, which may be intra-articular or extra-articular, then we want to see whether cartilage are fine or not. So my first question is uh, to Amit, sir. When do you do MRI in your practice? When, what is the indication of doing MRI in your practice? Amit, sir. Uh, see, uh, doing an MRI is... Uh pretty routine nowadays, uh, probably whenever I'm thinking of any problem of ligament, cartilage, meniscus, and the soft tissue around the knee, probably that is a case in which I'll do an MRI for that patient. So, Vivek, Sudeep, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, Vivek, after doing, yeah, definitely, thank you for the questions. Uh, after doing uh, the clinical evaluation and the X-ray finding, and if I need any further uh, clarification, I want to find out my more, I want to justify my findings, uh, like Amit said, for uh, evaluation of the cartilage, meniscus, or ligament, if I need further information, uh, then definitely I'll go for MRI. Okay, so... I think the knee MR. I'm stuck. Down arrow, Vivek. Down arrow. I'm stuck. Vivek, down arrow. Yeah, I'm stuck, sir. I'm doing it. Uh, Vivek, you have any problem? Yes, yes. It's, there is some problem, sir. Can I just carry on with uh, the other, like we had our uh, opinion from the clinician. What what are the opinions from our radiological uh, colleagues, radiologic clinic uh, colleagues that we should, uh, like Amit said, when we whenever we think of a soft tissue problem, we should have a MRI, like for the ligament, meniscus, or the cartilage. And uh, do you think an X-ray would be first step even before going for an MRI? Are you back, Vivek? Yes, I'm back, sir. Okay. So I was just putting on, uh, definitely if we, I mean, like do a clinical examination and then we just go on for an MRI or should we do a MRI uh, before MRI and X-ray evaluation, even if we think that there are these, the, the reason for my clinical finding may just be soft tissue. I'm having some problems, sir. Sir, you carry on, sir. Yeah. Uh, can we have the radiologist's opinion? Dr. Yubras? Yes. Yeah, anything before MRI, red, uh, radiographs, I think I prefer to see the radiograph as well to report to MRI. Uh, I, yeah, I think like uh, that, that is because going back to what Amit said also, you know, like uh, the, the case example which we saw after Amit's, Amit's presentation was that case if we had done a uh, maybe a simple standing X-ray that would have, have given us more idea there. So I, I'm always under this uh, uh, confusion, you know, like to find out what are the changes that occur with osteoarthritis is more relevant if you find, do an X-ray than MRI. Mm. Yes. Or yes. Do, do you? Yes. Yes. Routine protocol. We also. X-ray radiographs of the knee or any joint before re reporting any MRI, but uh, even without X-ray, we can report the soft tissue structures uh, and even bony structures. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back, sir. Uh, I can continue. You can continue. The yes, other sir. thing I just yeah. The other thing I uh, okay. Carry on, Vivek. Yeah. So I. Uh, I think the MRI knee is done to confirm our clinical diagnosis. Uh, we are we are pretty much here about the findings about clinical diagnosis that there is something wrong with the knee and we want to confirm it. And we want to add on something which we have which may, we may have missed without clinical examination. Or you know, whenever there is, uh, we, we cannot say anything without clinical examination, but we still think that there is some something wrong with uh, uh, without uh, with the knee. So these are various conditions when MRI of knee is done in our routine clinical practice. And one of the very important thing is the medical legal cause for which uh, we need to do MRI. So this is the questions to our radiology colleague, Dr. Sundar. What do you want us to do? What do you want clinicians to do when they prescribe MRI or then when they ask for MRI uh, to your department? Dr. Sundar. Thank you, Vivek, and I would like to thank uh, ASUN for giving me this opportunity. So actually, uh, I'm waiting for this type of uh, conversation with the clinician. Since in our Nepal, we are lagging the conversation between radiologists and clinicians, which is indeed very much helpful for the benefit of the patient. So regarding this question, as a radiologist, uh, I would like to uh, know detailed clinical findings of the patient which was sent for the MRI. Since uh, based on those clinical findings, we can concentrate our 
uh, MRI findings, or we can search for some uh, uh, those lesions which may be missed easily in MRI. So as Dr. Amit already showed, uh, those uh, sensitivity and specificity of uh, meniscal lesions which are less superior as compared to the clinical findings. So these are occurring since we are not getting clinical history. So as uh, we are not so much experienced as other colleagues in uh, Western countries regarding these uh, imaging findings, but still we are trying our best to look upon those things. But if we are given proper clinical history, uh, we can search okay. for those lesions as well. Sudar, sorry, I stopped you. These are two scenarios, two, two requisition forms I have uploaded here. Uh, how common is in your clinical practice, uh, one in the left and other in the right side? How common you find these type of pictures? The one in the left, nothing is written, even diagnosis has been queried. And in the right, the diagnosis has been written nicely and the history has been given very elaborately. How common you find these two scenarios? So in my clinical practice, uh, I find the most of the clinical uh, findings as that on the left side. So we are not properly given all those, all those histories. Only few of the uh, clinicians provide us the proper clinical history and all the clinical findings. Okay, Dr. Yubras, your experience. Yeah, yeah, in Nepal, I have seen only few of the clinicians, they give proper history and uh, clinical examination findings. If clinical examination findings and uh, history Nice history, then it is very uh, easy for us to focus which area to be focused. And uh, this will uh, also increase the uh, sensitivity and specificity of the reporting radiologist as well, I think. If you give yeah. for history. Yeah. Okay. Can I put up a question out here? Maybe yes, I yes, sir. Uh, yes, Sundar and uh, Yuvraj, uh, Dr. Sundar and Yuvraj, you are absolutely right. But uh, what link is missing out? here is use read only this referral slip if you go to the uh, opd ticket or the ticket with which the patient has come to which the clinician has examined the patient you will find out most of these informations there so if you want it's not only radiologists are busy don't take it otherwise the clinicians are also busy so if you want the clinician to write the same thing twice that means once in the regular OPD or the book that with which the patient has come and write the same thing on this paper, probably you are demanding a too much from a busy clinician. Someone who is not very much busy will write everything, but someone who is busy will not write. So probably a mid path for you is not only look at these uh, referral slip, but also look at the papers the patient is usually having. You will find out most of these information in that also. That is my humble suggestion to all our radiologists colleagues. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, so main purpose of keeping this slide is, uh, it's no point uh, blaming the radiologist and all because many a times even we 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 are busy in our clinical practice and we we tend to write just the diagnosis and even we we, we sometimes miss the diagnosis. So. It's good that radiologists be provided all the necessary information in clinical findings uh, beforehand so that they won't be beating around the bush uh, while reporting their MRI picture. So uh, it's all should be give and take that there should be maintained a perfect balance. And whenever, as uh, Amit sir has already mentioned, whenever there is clinical and radiological mismatch, the examination of yourself and the report from the radiologist, there is mismatch, always do not hesitate to talk with the radiologist or vice versa. So there should be, there should be maintained a perfect balance so that we, should, we could give a good result to our uh, clinical practice. So let us start with this uh, first case. Sudip sir, I want to take this case. Uh, Sudip sir, will yeah. you take this okay. case, sir? Yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, 38 years male, he's a physical teacher. He sustained injury to his right knee while playing futsal. He is not a professional player. He is an amateur player. Immediately after uh, injury, he has severe pain and there is a typical history of ACL injury. 
and on clinical examination with mild clinical examination the uh, finding is suggestive of acl tear so with these clinical findings uh, what will be your approach to this patient? You have already examined the patient. The history is suggestive of ACL tear. What will be your approach, sir? Uh, definitely, uh, my after the um, clinical examinations, I'll do the simple plain X-ray, AP and lateral. Yes. I'll try to see if there is any radiological finding. I can see the X-ray, and after that, definitely I go. Even if my I have a clinical diagnosis ACL tear, I would like to do MRI for this patient. MRI when, sir? When will you like to do MRI? Uh, as soon as possible, within a week, or maybe within a day or two. Okay. I would not like to wait. Amit sir. Amit, sir, will you wait for one week, or will you do immediate uh, MRI straight away? Uh, I absolutely agree with Sudip, sir. I will not be satisfied only with the ACL tear. Uh, my clinical examination will include the status of the meniscus which is more important if i find that the meniscus is also injured uh, which, which may require repair i say to send it immediately immediately means it's not in within hours but let the patient have some quiet time it is painless because mri requires about 45 minutes of sitting into a single position with, without movement of the knee so give some analgesics one or two days time then you decide that you get an mri done for the patient Yes, um, there has been classical teaching and Bible of orthopedics, the Campbell operative orthopedics has mentioned that MRI should be delayed for about six weeks after acute knee injury because early done, earlier done MRI should be with picture of knee and the reporting becomes very difficult in these conditions. Dr. Yubras, uh, is there any difference in reporting of uh, MRI which is done acutely and which is done after about six weeks or eight weeks. That is after uh, the quiet period and the hot period is over. Ibras. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, definitely during, as you have already mentioned, in the acute phase, there are a lot of findings which will obscure the uh, most important finding as well. Because with this hematoma, all edema, even sometimes fat flu levels and everything that will obscure the finding. And sometimes the most important finding can be missed. And if you delay for maybe six months. Like Dr. Vigas, Dr. Vigas, sorry to interrupt. Most in important findings like what, what can be missed if we uh, do MRI in acute setting? Suppose, uh, suppose you are saying this MRI of the knee, uh, an injured knee then uh, you are missing some edema or definite tear. Just okay. edema or tear, just like uh, your root tear is there and uh, mm -hmm. other um, bony injuries are there. Then mm -hmm. if you do all the reporting together, then mm -hmm. there is a high chance that you will miss the finding sometimes. Because every corner, okay. every corner you have to see, we have to find out where to focus the lesion, where to focus the MRI re reporting. After six weeks, then all the uh, this hematoma and edema, other uh, abnormalities will be resolving. Then the main abnormality will be there so that clearly we can guide the clinicians by reporting the MRI. Sometimes because of this air and uh, even air is inside the joint, then we can be confused with whether this is calcification or air foci like that also. That is one of the possibility. And other external wound injuries uh, also will okay. hear the reporting. Okay, Dr. Sundar, same question. Uh, what would you like to report? The earlier done MRI or MRI after six weeks? Uh, in earlier MRI, we may get some problem like the patient may be in discomfort and patient may not be uh, able to sit uh, quietly. Doing, no, uh, that has been taken the, care of. That has been taken care of. The the acute stage has been over. We acute means not immediately after trauma. So I I think for about after three to five days when patient is comfortable to stay for about forty five minutes for MRI. So, uh, I, what would you I, like I, to do? For? Uh, one thing, uh, in some cases, uh, due to the hematoma of those things, we might uh, miss some like we might be, uh, it's difficult for us to differentiate partial tear and acute tear. So with the resolution of those hematoma later on, we can uh, accurately uh, 
delineate these two partial uh, complete tier of any ligaments. So that make, make uh, difference. And also the presence of large uh, amount of knee fusion uh, might distort the anatomy of the uh, knee joint. So which might also uh, bring some artifacts within the knee joint. So it may produce some, uh, it may cause some difficulty in depicting some lesions in those cases. That's why uh, we should wait for a few um, uh, weeks for prior to the knee of those ACL tears or any other acute injury cases. Uh, Amit sir, you want to add something? I saw you raise fingers. Amit sir, please on mute. I don't want to add, but I want to request our radiological radiologist colleague to start looking at uh, MRI of acutely injured knee because we cannot wait for six weeks. Suppose a meniscus which has been torn today will not be repairable after six weeks. Okay? Or um, a ligament which is partially torn today, which requires just a repair. After six weeks, we have to do a bigger mm -hmm. surgery for that. So yes, I understand there are certain artifacts will be there, but certain literature also says that these hematoma will enhance also the lesion. It acts like, like a enhancing material, like we do an arthrogram, you know, in certain cases. Suppose, as a Sundar doctor was saying that there is a partial tear of the meniscus, under surface tear of the meniscus, the hematoma goes inside the meniscus and it will enhance the lesion. So, if we think that looking in general the MRI, yes, you are right. But when we know that what are the structures we are going to see, probably uh, it will not make uh, a very big difference. And to request to our radiologist colleague that we want MRI to be done as soon as the patient is feasible for sitting for 45 minutes to one hour so that the MRI can be done. So, so this, uh, this controversy about the timing of MRI has been there for time immemorial. And uh, the, there has been a good conclusion about when to do MRI. There has been many studies about the cost benefit ratio about the MR scans done earlier and later after six weeks. And it has shown that, uh, like Amit sir already mentioned, the repairable conditions, the, the minor surgeries or smaller surgeries, patient may get away with the uh, repair uh, surgeries or smaller surgery if they can be picked up or they can be detected early. And the only way we can detect them early is to do early MRI. So the whole reason why we need early MRI is the early diagnosis of those repairable conditions like the uh, tear of meniscus, tear of root, the repairable tear of the ACL, which will be irreparable after about a, a few weeks time. So, and uh, let's go on with the case number two. Amit sir, uh, I think you have to take this. This is 35 years female. Uh, she fell down from scooter, had injury in left knee for about five years. Knee is not normal since then. She has visited multiple centers. Uh, MRI was done three months back. She was advised physio, physio, physio. I mean, sir, will you excuse me? I want to ask Yubras first. Uh, Dr. Yubras, uh, can you read this MRI? So these are the <coughs> proton density weights. Yeah. Proton density, right? It's not written. Uh, so yeah. Oh, it's not written. Skeletal images. The ACL is if you left. want any more cord. Yeah, okay. this uh, anterior cruciate ligament is lax here, but few okay. continuity, any more? <coughs> continuity of the fibers can be seen here in a sagittal image. Then in coronal image, this attachment, humeral attachment is okay. Then going down. So Okay, Dr. Yubras. Sundar, then, can you add? Then, okay, wait, wait, this about the cartilage. Okay. I, I cannot okay. see the lateral compartment cartilage in full. However, okay. medial side also, this cartilage is not that much clear because maybe it is not high resolution image. And um, many sky. Mm, so, Dr. Yubras, what is, what is your problem with this image? What is your problem? 
Yeah, I most of the time I prefer fat uh, fat suppressed images, fat suppressed images for uh, this proper reporting, and okay. comparing sagittal and coronal together most of the time, and uh, okay. this is fat suppressed image, so it is very difficult to say whether there is a partial tear or full thickness tear or cartilage defect or any flap tears is there, so I think this okay. is not adequate to report. Okay. Okay, points well taken. Uh, Dr. Sundar, any problem uh, with these pictures? Ek you... minute hold uh, the zoom chalta Hello? Uh, Vivek, uh, I'm sorry to say I'm having blurred images in my screen. So I'm okay. not being able to see all these images clearly. Okay, Amit sir. Yeah, absolutely, what the, the problem Sundar was highlighting that if your images are of not very good quality that you can read off, probably that is a point you should think of doing an next MRI. In this, I am not able to visualize. This is a very poor quality MRI that you have given me. And if I plan my treatment with these poor quality images, you are not going to get a good uh, outcome. I don't know what you have put here, absolutely. but this is absolutely what I want. You know, Not the previous one. This is a very poor. I will not read this MRI. If the patient persists, I'll so, base on clinical examination. I'll repeat the MRI in this patient. So this is this was this is the point I want I wanted to highlight. This is the the previous image. This image is the zero point three Tesla image, and nothing is much clear over there. We can just guess that something is wrong over there, but we are not clear. And real reporting of this MRI was grade two changes of posterior horn of medial meniscus, but. A great two change in posterior horn of medial men. What we did was we repeated the MRI and see the 1.3 Tesla image, the clarity of image we get with the 1.3 Tesla image. This is same knee, uh, the sagittal view and the coronal view. The image quality uh, changes drastically. You, Bras, what would you like to prefer? The first image or this picture? <clears throat> Dr. You, Bras. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely these uh, later pictures because they have, I think, 1.5 Tesla MRI with... Uh, so this is, this is my whole, whole motto. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this uh, field of view is also uh, small in this case. So clearly seen many sky ligaments uh, and uh, everything is so clear in the later image. So definitely we prefer this uh, later so, image reporting. Yep. Vivek, can I just add this? So there this was to the... yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Vivek, just, I just want to add to the radiologist colleague. What is the problem here? I mean, why that we are getting this blurred vision? The first, uh, the is it because the flim? The problem yes, is sir. that or? One problem in first image was the field of view. This field of view is very large. So that uh, due to that also, there is a less resolution of the no, no, what I, what I mean is Dr. Yubras. I, I, yeah, I, I just, I'm just not talking about the quality here. Uh, yeah. Whenever you do a MRI reading, you do your MRI reading in the screen, in the monitor, isn't it? Yes, sir. Right? Whenever you make a diagnosis of ACL tear or a, anything abnormal in the knee, you scroll in your monitor up and down and make sure you find the pathology. Or you can't just say with one cut that there is an ACL tear or a meniscus tear. So I, what I mean to say is this, this was more of a MRI that is done in a commercial way. The, the radiologists need to be more responsible that if you have that finding in your monitor, you should be able to take out that, uh, that image and give it to the, uh, the, 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 I mean, send the report, send that image, you know, like what I've seen more practical, I'm saying, I'm not blaming everybody, but one of the problem here is maybe the film that was used was not done that responsibly. You understand what I mean? So I, I, when I get a film like this, that is what I mean. You know, like when you have a MRI center within your hospital, if you, if you do not find your clinical finding does not cor correlate with your MRI finding, then you go down to your radiologist, you stay, sit with your radiologist and you scroll the monitor, then you can do a better diagnosis in conjunction with your radiologist uh, friend. And am I correct in saying that? Unfortunately, Iswardai, this is not available everywhere. Uh, 
MRI yeah, is I a agree. very costly affair. Uh, so probably we have to come to a consensus that uh, probably I would request all the radiologists to provide the CD of the patients, you know, CD of the recordings so that whenever the patient goes, uh, so the doctor doesn't need to run to radiologist house or radiologist room. He can sit in his own computer and look at all those things. Yeah, but but poor so, quality MRI do, cannot be compared with the good cal quality MRI. Either you scroll into the the monitor or you do not scroll. The poor quality is a poor quality. So that's no, the I, point what I I'm saying is this, this has become a poor quality because the there is a problem in developing the films or something like that. But if you if you have the city of no, the original one, maybe you could. So sir, the first image was from zero point three Tesla uh, MRI and second was from one point five Tesla. So there is um, there is that drastic difference with the 0 0.3 Tesla. The um, main theme of uh, keeping this slide is uh, we have to discourage, I think, um, 0 0.3 Tesla, and we have to at least have 1.3 Tesla image uh, for mus musculoskeletal radiology uh, for uh, ligaments and meniscus around the knee. I think um, Yuvraj and Sundar will agree in this thing. Uh, Yuvraj, do you agree? Yes, we can get at least. I I suggest at least one point five Tesla MRI for musculoskeletal okay. radiology to report. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can I can so, I have a question, Vivek? Yes, sure. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's to both uh, Ishwar Amit and uh, both uh, radiologists. Uh, how often, uh, as some Amit suggested, that if you are in doubt, you uh, ask for the CD, definitely it's very, very good idea. But how often uh, the radiologists uh, prefer to give this CD? And uh, even, and uh, if you get a patient, many times we get patients from outside and they usually come with the cuts. Uh, so how often uh, it is, is it practical to ask for CD uh, from the radiologist? From the, I'll that, was my, my that was my question. <laughs> I'll give you my experience, you know, like, uh... Uh, nowadays, the more uh, recent uh, uh, practice has been, I mean, it's, it even cuts the uh, cost of developing a film, you know, that really cuts, cuts, yeah. down, the, cuts down the cost. But uh, I don't know, you know, I, I've, I've talked with Yubraj and our colleague, radiologist colleague, but does the CD open in every, you know, is it, is it a universal thing? You know, I get a CD from the Middle East, you know, somewhere from America or Australia, then I go to my uh, MRI center and I ask them and very, you know, less than more, you know, it's very unusual to, you know, read that, read, uh, open up the CD and then look up at the images. That has been my practical, you know. Uh, what do you think, the radiologist friends, you know, what do you say about that? Can you open up all the CD that come from all over the world? No, sir, we cannot. Because uh, in most of the CDs, what we get from Kathmandu, do, we are able to review the city reports, but when I got, we got from outside the country, maybe some software problem, I am not sure, but I could not open the cities. But within Nepal, so, that is possible? Yes, I have done so many times, sir, even in DNB. Okay. Yes. So, Dr. Yubraj, when you were doing your fellowship in, Philipp uh, I think in Philippines, right? No, Singapore. Uh, Singapore, sorry. Uh, yeah. What they used to do, they used to provide the films or they used to provide the CDs. What they used yeah, to do? They used to give CDs also, CDs most of the time, CDs. CDs and also or only CDs? Uh, report, uh, because the patients to bring CDs also sometimes, because we don't need actually CDs there because everything is there within the, where we can see any time from anywhere. So, but, but I have seen patient carrying the CDs also. Maybe they requested, I'm not sure. So my, my purpose of keeping this slide is why can't we change in, uh, the, uh, why can't we change our practice in Nepal? Uh, I, I have seen so many radiologist friends joining in our panel discussion. Uh, why can't we uh, add a CD in, a, in that report back uh, uh, in addition to that uh, report? What is your take on this, Dr. Yuvraj? Is yeah, it that definitely. Difficult? No, it is not difficult at all because these technicians, they easily can give the series with this all the these images there. So um, it's not a difficult at all. It's a very easy task. So I think we, we, as, we as a combined practice, uh, radiologists and uh, clinicians, I think 
from uh, now onwards, we should try to uh, provide the CDs and the uh, the films. Uh, whoever like to see the films, they will see the films. And if you want to, if a clinician want to have a detailed analysis of that lesion, he can go into uh, the CD and see the images, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because yeah. if the patients, they request, even in BNBU, they give the CD just, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there so, is one very relative question that has just popped up, you know. Most of our most of us are now using very updated, you know, laptops, and there is a uh, question from somebody: uh, Would it be okay to provide USB rather than CD? Yeah, that's I wanted to ask the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is quite because relevant. Dr. You know? Yeah, Dr. Ubras, change my Ubras laptop. We said here there is no C option of CD. Only the yeah, CD has USB become outdated yeah. nowadays. You know. Yeah. What do you think, Dr. Ubras? USB. Um, maybe, possible. I'm not sure about this because they only give CDs here, but I have to okay. talk to them, these technicians, whether it is don't, physical here. Yeah. Don't bring your uh, OPD stuff into your um, home, you know. Keep a desktop in your OPD, which has a ready end. <laughs> this is a software which is called ready end, which ready is end, yes, really sir. available. Ready end will open 99.9% .9 of the disks. Coming from even yes. Akas Patal Jamada Ipun, it will most of the time it will open. Ready and yes, I want to yes, same same thing, sir. Many, many CDs which were not opened with default uh, DICOM viewer in our um, in our um, um, center that has been opened with ready and I think we had last experience with this similar uh, experience when I was with Ubras. So is it a also Vivek. It is, it is yes, not sir. the radiologist will change. It is we, the clinician, will change the practice of getting the CD. So when I yes, ask yes. If, if someone who wants to go outside our BNB hospital to get an MRI done, I do not stop them. They can go anywhere they want. But I ask that provided you bring a CD along with you. So go to an MRI center which, who will give you a CD of the MRI. So then uh, they go here and there, but they come up with the uh, CD of the MRI. If I have CD, then I have URAS. I can give CD to him and he'll read uh, again for me. So and that MRI center must have at least 1.3 Tesla image. Yeah, yeah, right, of sir? Course. Of course. If, yes. if they, if so they can't they, provide they, CD, I, I, I'll not I, take the MRI from there. Dr. Sundar. Uh, so yes. regarding CD, uh, we have few issues with CD. So. As the source said, uh, most, of the us, most of us may not have a uh, facility to read the CD. And also another problem with CD is it gets scratched easily since the patient may not be handling it properly and it gets scratched easily. So that's why uh, initially it might read well, but the, from next time onwards, it might not read well. So that's the issue with CD. And another issue with CD, providing CD and USB. For the USB, we have no authority to provide USB or provide uh, images in USB in our country till now. Since uh, we have issue of uh, introducing virus from the USB to the system, it will corrupt all the softwares of the MRI. But if we okay. bring brand new USB uh, with us and we can use, definitely we can use that without any risk of virus infection in our system. So for that, uh, we need to ask the patient to bring brand new uh, USB since uh, our hospital will not be providing those USB since it's uh, expensive. Also, CD also hospital is not providing us CD uh, for the patient. Patient has to bring the CD as well. So for this, we can lobby with our uh, administration, uh, hospital administ administration for the uh, brand new uh, pen drive or USB drive for all those cases. It might be more helpful than the CD. Okay, okay, okay. Points well taken. So uh, our conclusion is it's better to have both the uh, CD or USB along with the films rather than having only one, uh, only the film as the practice is now. Okay, Dr. Sundar, uh, the, uh, I have demos, I have uh, posted some of the pictures of MRIs over there. Uh, there is something common with these MRIs. Uh, please, please read it. Uh, so these are the... Uh, fat set uh, PD societal images. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, diagnosis. Uh... I'm see, looking at it. So, in this image, we can see this is the place for the ACL, and ACL is completely okay. placed by the ultra signal intensity. We can see heterogeneous high signal intensity at the region of the ACL, 
we are not seeing the uh, low signal intensity fibers of the ACL in this image. And similar okay. findings also okay. seen in this image as well. So we can see the PCL clearly. In this image also, we can okay. see the PCL fiber, but we are not being able to see the So your ACL. diagnosis is ACL tear, right? Yes. So ACL tear. Is it complete ACL tear or partial ACL tear? So by this, by looking at this image, it's complete ACL tear. Okay. So this is the main problem, as Amit sir also highlighted in his talk. We have problem with complete ACL tears and partial ACL tears. Many tears, many reports we get as uh, the partial tears, and we we not only us, the treating clinician out there in periphery, and the patient who can read the reports, they will also get carried away that the partial tear. Okay, my ACL is not torn completely. I can do anything, and even. Uh, some surgeons who are not experienced with uh, sports injuries, they say that your ACL is not torn completely. Topic ACL puri chatte ko sahi na, ali ke dimantar chatte ko, ali ke the exercise garnu, stage pachi apnu khel suru garnu. So we have problems with these kinds of reports, and what happens is they continue with their uh, sports and they come with the complications. So these are the reports of all these MRIs. See, common in all these things is there is some somewhere there are mentioned partial tear. Uh, some some reports uh, we they, we have high grade partial tear of ACL. Some reports mentioned grade two ACL tear, and some reports mentioned near complete mid substance tear. So my questions to radiologists is this has always been a controversy and this has always been a problem for us clinician. How much tear is a partial? How much tear of ACL tear is partial tear? Is there anything like partial tear? Uh, Yuvras, you please take this one first. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, when only anteromedial or posteromedial bundle is torn, then we call it partial tear. Otherwise, okay. uh, sometimes most of the fibers are uh, heterogeneous, then we call this partial tear. Uh, if we can continuously see all of the fibers, but few of the uh, one of the bundle fibers are not seen, then we say partial tear. Uh, yeah, most of the time like that. Okay, Sundar. So, like the, Dr. Yura said, uh, we must have to look for the fibers, uh, whether the fibers are intact or not. If any of the fibers are seen intact, then we can say those are the partial tear only. But if any fibers are not visualized separately, then that's the complete tear. So, at least some fibers must, uh, must, be, con must be continuous among these two bundles, right? Yes. Dr. Yura? Okay, uh, yes. I want to take the opinion of clinicians on uh, partial tear. I have seen many, uh, Isor sir. I just wanted to add, you know, like when you say there is a, I quite agree with Dr. Yuraj and Dr. Shual that if you have, if you, can, if you do not see uh, one of the bundle as whether a PL or a anterometer, you call, you call it a partial tear. And of course the continuity of the fiber, you have to guess also, but how much, uh, do you depend on in these kind of cases where you say that just the anterior middle or a posterior lateral bundle is torn and the secondary findings, you know, like definitely if a partial tear is there, there must be some laxity. What about the, uh, the secondary, uh, you know, uh, in, indirect evidence of the ACL tear? Would that give us some idea of, you know, like whether we should be treating or not? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, definitely um, these secondary other signs like second uh, fracture, other menis, menis, medial meniscal fiber tear, they will add uh, this uh, specificity. But uh, most of the time what happens is plane of the imaging. That is uh, not adequate. Sometimes if the fibers of the ACL are in one direction, then the imaging plane is in other direction, then we cannot detect it in full detail. So that's why most of the time, there are various uh, techniques have been developed for complete evaluation of the ACL fibers, because it is not uh, completely sagittal, it is somehow obliquely oriented. Yeah, that's why it is sometimes difficult to say whether this is partial tear or no tear at all also. Yes. So the, the okay. technique, the person who does the ACL, that is usually done by a technologist or a technician, they need to yes. be very mm -hmm. much aware of what we want to find out. You know, if you think that there is an ACL tear and the plane of the uh, uh, scan is not in the proper alignment, then we can easily miss it. Yes, definitely, sir. 
Thank you. Sudip sir, your opinion regarding partial tear, uh, how common is partial tear reporting in your clinical practice, Sudip sir? Yeah, it is uh, very much reported. Uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Ishwar suggested that, and Dr. Yuva suggested that you try to take the oblique cut, but that is, I think, mm -hmm. practically possible only in institution where you have MRI in your own center, and then you can talk to radiologists and find ask for the such views. But places like us, uh, Chitman, we have only two or three centers, and so we do, do talk to the radiologists. But many times we are not able to get those uh, results. So if whenever I get partial tear or something I'm at this remote, I totally go with my clinical finding and my basic idea is whether ACL is functional ACL or not. Whatever may be the result, if the patient is giving a result of pivot shift, if my clinical findings are uh, in the two hours, the ACL uh, rupture, even if it's a partial uh, rupture, I will consider it as a complete non-functional ACL and I'll go with the, the same clinical decision. So just a random guess, sir, how, uh, what is the, uh, uh, in your practice, how many of the partial, the MRIs that has been reported partial tear had complete tear on arthroscopy in your experience? Uh, I think, uh, I don't have real percentage, but I think I can say 60 to 70 percent. Because by the time I go inside, they are usually, uh, they come down and attach to the PCL and it is reported as a partial tear. Amit sir, same question. Amit sir. Okay, I think he is, uh, Ishwar sir, can you answer this one? Uh, in your yes. practice, uh, the re MRI has been reported as partial tear and you find complete tear in uh, arthroscopy. How common is this? Yeah, I, yeah I, I also agree with Dr. Sutip in that what is your uh, gut feeling, you know, what do you find in your clinical, if it is a high grade of ACL laxity, then you would, even if you do not find the uh, MRI reports matching your clinical uh, finding, then you have to take in. I think uh, previously it, it used to be, that is why uh, Amit had also put in that MRI reading should be done by the clinician also. So when you mm -hmm. feel you have your clinical finding which is suggestive of an ACL tear and your MRI is not that supportive, and uh, when you feel that you have a complete, you know, you, you're dependent on your finding, that you have to convince the patient that uh, although even that the report is not conclusive with your clinical finding, but I'm sure that you have to counsel your patient to make sure. Uh, regarding percentage, you know, like previously, it this all comes with experience, you know, like uh, when... Mm -hmm. Uh, in the last five, 10 years, uh, as you can see, you know, that there are more and more MSK musculoskeletal uh, radiography trained people who are more, you know, interested and more keen on finding, finding out and helping us also. I definitely yes, think it was very, very high, high proportion of uh, that went, as you said, partial tear, tear becoming a complete tear in your operating finding, but that seems to be going yes. down, you know. And, and we are also okay. getting better. My, I myself am getting better that even though the radiologist has a report that that's a partial tear, I do a proper clinical examination and I counsel the patient, you know, that there is a tear and I usually uh, have lesser chance of missing uh, a complete okay. tear, which has been reported as a partial tear. Okay, okay sir. I, 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 I can, can I just Rajiv, sir, add a, yes, a small yes, point? Sir. Please, please, sir. Hello, Vivek? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Please go on. Amit, sir, are you there? Yeah, some, somehow I'm not uh, getting okay. Can can I add a small, very small that I have burned my finger with the with the this uh, report of partial ACL tear, and most of the time I have found that these are complete tears with the big remnants, as I mentioned in my presentation. So I become very cautious when I see a report of partial tear and request our radiologist colleague also. When you report the partial tear, you be cautious, be more extra cautious, identify either it is really a partial tear or not. Thank you. Okay. I can see Rajiv sir and Binod sir as well. Rajiv sir, what is your experience? Because I want to stick with this slide a uh, little more because we are very much, as Amit sir has told, many of us has burnt our fingers in this partial tier. Uh, Rajiv sir, can you come in, sir? 
what is your experience okay vivek uh, can you hear me yes yes sir okay. yes sir. Uh, regarding uh, what i have to say on partial tears is prior to sending the mri i already have a clinical diagnosis so okay. prior to sending it sending it for a radiological opinion i already know what i'm going to expect now if i find okay. that all my acl injury tests are positive and the radiologist reports a partial tear then i'm going to send that mri back to the radiologist for a review mm -hmm. saying that these okay. tests are positive kindly review the mri and most of the time they would send back the report saying that it is a complete tear based okay, on the fine. clinical information that i'm giving them and there's not sir here one, one one comment i'd like to make okay. see when when we okay. read our mris like amit was previously saying that we must all we said this before so that we must learn how to read our mris because you know when we start reading our mris the first thing we do is like when pgs go for an exam they already know the diagnosis right when when uh -huh. my pgs go for the exam if they already know the diagnosis then they are trying to make everything according to the diagnosis that they know okay mm -hmm. so that is not how we should be looking at mris initially you take out the mris from the uh, from your uh, folder and look at them sequentially you must look at everything in the mri we tend to jump if we find an acl injury we just tend to ignore everything and just be happy with it it's like looking at these hand injuries right multiple fractures in the hand and the spine so you must expect that the patient may have other problems <coughs> look at everything sequentially like a diagnostic arthroscopy and then finally come to a diagnosis do not develop tunnel vision because that's okay. where you start missing things yeah, so that's what i have to say a binod binod sir can you add something how common is partial tear in your practice uh, thank you vivek <clears throat> as already mentioned by all the panelists i do agree with that we get lot of patients report uh, stating that the patient has partial tear of ml uh, acl in fact most of them have complete tear i completely agree with dr rajiv also that we should be very thorough with our own clinical judgment in diagnosing these kind of tear and i would say that around 80% of the cases of these partial tears are complete tear in my practice okay okay so why why i try to stick with this slide little more is that uh, there has been problem with the diagnosis of partial tear uh, as sundar dr sundar has mentioned he has been waiting for this type of discussion so this is our uh, advice or this is our opinion that many of us clinicians who who are experienced in uh, knee surgeries has mentioned that most of these partial tears reportings come out to be complete tear and what happens is uh, the learned uh, patients there are many learned patients who are well educated and they see partial tear or minimal tear and they get fussy you know they, they when we advise that you have torn acl and you need surgery they they become little hesitant and uh, they they delay the surgery and continue their activities and thereby resulting in the various complications like they result into having more um, meniscus injuries cartilage injuries so my, my humble request is to our radiologists whenever before reporting any partial tear of acl please communicate with the uh, clinician or uh, think twice before uh, reporting the partial tear because most of these partial tear come out to be complete tear like uh, our uh, clinicians has already mentioned almost about 70 to 80% of uh, their in their clinical practice partial tear come out to be uh, the complete tear okay so <clears throat> let's proceed um, let's proceed and let's uh, some talk something about acl tear in mri dr yuvras direct and indirect signs of uh, acl tear in mri are there uh, what you rely or you rely in both yubras no actually if you you don't see any ligament fibers then direct okay. fluid fill gap or non visual visualization of uh, acl means fibers at all that is direct sign and that is the most reliable sign if you don't see at okay. all then that is definitely a tear but if you see some fibers so and edematous mm -hmm. fibers signal heterogeneity mm -hmm. and the orientation mm. of the fiber also that is very important yeah dr amit sir told that this orientation of the fiber in this image if you see 
this is not uh, quite uh, making angle posteriorly. Maybe parallel or just uh, not at all parallel. And signal heterogeneity and the uh, absence of the fibers in the middle, midline, middle, that is mid substance. Maybe complete. Okay, uh, I, excuse me, but, I, I stopped. Yeah, you. this is the direct oh. sign here. But if you see okay, the okay, direct sign, like, direct sign. Okay, hmm. Yuvraj. Um, excuse me. So direct signs mean the either the ligaments are not visible or ligaments uh, we see the torn ligaments or we do not see we see the uh, signal int intensity change within these uh, ligaments. So this is there is no problem with the direct signs. The problem arises when, as uh, Dr. Amit has already mentioned, uh, we see good um, hypo uh, intense the ACL signal and. A patient has a clinically ACL tear. In those conditions, what are the uh, indirect signs you look for to diagnose the ACL injury? Uh, the clinician has given you all the details regarding the ACL injury. He has mentioned the, all the tests uh, which points towards the ACL injury and you cannot find the direct signs. So what are the indirect signs you rely upon in those conditions? Yeah, definitely this uh, contusion of the pattern, contusion pattern of the bone. Here we say most okay. of the time this pivot shift type of contusion pattern that is uh, okay. contusion of the bone in the lateral femoral condyle and this uh, notch, okay. the sulcus, sulcus terminalis notch will be deeper and tibial plateau posterior okay. lateral contusion and even also second fracture and uh, sometimes mm -hmm. meniscus injury, sorry, medial uh, collateral ligament injury. All these are indirect signs because they are often related to this ACL injury because the specific pattern of injury, that's why we get these indirect signs also. Sometimes okay. that may not be true. Okay. okay. Dr. Sundar, can you add? Dr. Yuvara has oh. mentioned pretty much decent amount of the indirect signs. Can you add some more indirect signs? So as uh, Amit sir already mentioned, we must have to look at the angle the ligament is uh, forming with the blue set line. So in this image, we can see this. Sorry, uh, okay, in this image, we can see this ACL is making good angle with the blue set angle. So we have the negative blue set angle. So its apex is directed superiorly. However, uh, if the apex between the this blue set angle is directed inferiorly, it's post blue set angle. So that means the ACL is slagging. So there is slagging of the ACL, which is one of the sign of the ACL tear. So another sign, okay. as Uras mentioned, we have we can see the deep sulcus sign in the lateral femoral condyle, which is one of the indirect sign. Another thing we have to see is the morphology of the PCL or orientation of the PCL. So with the lagging yeah. or slagging of this ACL, we may have to see, we might see the PCL buckling. Also this deformity of PCL, um, uh, we can have few lines along the posterior aspect of the PCL, like PCL line, which must, uh, if we draw tangential line from the posterior aspect of PCL, it must cross the, uh, this one is, it must cross the medullary cavity of the femur within the five centimeter. So distal femoral okay. cap. So if it's not crossing this distance, then we have we can say the PCL is buckling, so which is also one of the indirect sign of the ACL tear. And also we can measure the, okay. for the angle. Uh, I'll stop you, Dr. Sundar. For the interest of all the participants, the ACL tear is one of the very easiest thing to be discovered in, uh, to be recognized in MRI of knee. Uh, the ACL appears as thin, hypointense, black shadow that is almost parallel to the Blumen sets lines. And these Blumen sets line and ACL uh, makes acute angle. This two meets at the apex and they makes acute angle. Whenever there is ACL tear, what happens is usually the ACL tears from the femoral side and the ACL goes down, falls down. So what happens? These, this is normal ACL uh, Blumen sets angle, which is uh, or nearly, which is usually less than 15 degree. And when ACL is torn and ACL falls down, this ACL women sets angle become more than 15 degree. That means the angle becomes acute in the other side than the intact ACL. And this is uh, tibia, is ACL angle. This is called ACL angle. And this must be less than 45 degree in the ACL tear 
because ACL falls down. And there are many other indirect signs like the contusions. This is what uh, Dr. Yubras has mentioned. This is pivot shift contusion because of a typical injury mechanism that causes ACL tear. There is contusion within the lateral compartment of the lateral femoral condyne. This is the bruises, bone bruise, typical bone bruise. If we do early MRI, we can detect this. And this is deep lateral femoral sulcus signs. If the lateral femoral sulcus is more than 1.5 millimeter, that is also an indirect signs. And this is the various indirect signs that Dr. Sundar has mentioned. PCL line, if we draw the line tangential to the posterior PCL, then it must pass through, through the medulla of the medullary canal of the femur. And when there is a CL tear, what happens is tibia sacs anteriorly because of which the PCL becomes angulated and the PCL line goes backwards. And this is another sign because of anterior translation of tibia, the lateral meniscus becomes exposed more. And this is very practical sign that is PCL angle. If the two limbs of uh, the PCL, if the line is made from two limbs of PCL, and if this PCL angle is less than 107 degree, these are the various indirect signs of the ACL tear. And there has been, uh, we, we did the literature review and ACL angle, ACL Blumen sets angle were very, very sensitive and specific for the diagnosis as very, very sensitive and specific indirect signs for ACL tear. And bone contusions, PCL line and PCL angle were relatively sensitive and specific and uh, lower down are less sensitive and specific. So whenever you see for ACL tear, see for the direct signs and see for the indirect signs and never miss ACL line, ACL women's sets line angle and ACL angle. And uh, Amit sir was also mentioning in his talk uh, about this ACL women's sets angle. Okay. So... <clears throat> Let's go to uh, let's let's go and talk uh, about meniscus. Dr. Sundar, we often see uh, the report like grade one, grade two, or grade three in meniscus. So what what actually um, uh, what actually is the meaning of all this, Dr. Sundar? So uh, grade one tear means there is globular increased signal density within the uh, meniscus, but the signal density is not extending up to the articular surfaces. And okay, uh, in case of grade two, there is uh, linear alter signal density within the meniscus. Also, again, this alter signal density is not extending uh, into the articular surface. Whereas in case of grade okay. 3 tier, the alter signal density is extending into the articular surface. So basically what we call tier is this grade 3 tier. Grade 1 and grade 2, these are only degenerative changes. And grade 3 is actual tier. So for the same so, tier, so uh, alter sir, if we, if, OK, OK, go on. So for uh, saying tear, uh, the alter signal density should extend up to the articular surface, either the superior or inferior articular surfaces. Okay, okay. Sudip, sir, uh, what is your take on this grade one, grade two, grade three? Uh, I think um, in our clinical practice, the meniscus reporting of meniscus is more problematic than ACL and PCL reporting. Uh, Sudip sir, what is your take on this? Grade one, grade two, grade three. How common is that uh, the reports are grade two, patient is not happy, you counsel him for arthroscopy and it come, uh, comes out to be grade three? Uh, many times, uh, of course, the grade two, it uh, looks like a Instra some stamps tear. If it's the tear is not from through and through, the signals are not from the superior to inferior surface of the meniscus. Uh, and if the patient is symptomatic, um, there the cause of pain can be something different. So instra some stamps tear or signal like this in grade one, grade two, uh, we do not need to operate in this kind of patients. But at grade three, definitely we will require some kind of uh, operative intervention. So message from this slide is grade three is a real tier uh, of surgical importance. Grade one and grade two are, as Dr. Sundar has mentioned, intra-substance degeneration, and they usually are not so much symptomatic. And grade three means the tear that has extended either superiorly or inferiorly that has reached to the intra-articular region. So they are symptomatic and those are surgically important. So we should be focused more on grade three. Radiologists, uh, for radiologists, even grade one is there, grade two is there. For us surgeon, I think grade three is only the meniscus tier. Yeah, yeah. So there are many tiers, uh, 
morphology that can be described like longitudinal radial horizontal and uh, there has been studies about the vascularity the peripheral part is more vascular and uh, medial the central part is less vascular and there has been study there has been uh, a physiological proof about the various types of fibers like radial and circumferential fibers that makes the hoop stress dr sundar uh, we we whenever we deal with the tear of meniscus we think about uh, two things one is whether we can repair this meniscus or not if not repairable we have to excise it so uh, all can and, and the decision of preserving a meniscus or uh, excising a meniscus depends upon the types of meniscus and location of tear okay so here mri becomes very very vital can mri predict the location of tear can mri predict actual type of tear this is my question sundar sir dr sundar uh, so definitely we can uh, predict the location of the tear so whether the tear is located along the periphery or uh, along the free margin of the meniscus since the peripheral portion of the meniscus is vascular red zone so if the tear is located within the uh, peripheral zone it is uh, repairable whereas if the tear is located along the free margin only it's uh, difficult to repair or it's not repairable so we can definitely assess in mri the location of the tear whether it's located in the periphery or it's within the free margin and regarding other types of tear sure. like red sure. tear yes Sundar, when you report your MRIs, do you mention that it is within two millimeter of the periphery or four millimeter of periphery, or you you just mention it is in the periphery or it is in the central part? So we usually because mention that, uh, that it's whether <clears throat> central or peripheral. Uh, we usually don't uh, measure the distance actually. Okay, Doc, you were asked same questions. Do you mention the exact? Uh, uh, dimensions like the tear is this much uh, distant from the periphery. Yeah, in practice, uh, we are not measuring, but it is better to measure exact distance from the capsule. How far is the tear? Whether it is red zone or red white zone or white 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 zone. So in practice, we are not following, but it is better if we could do that. Can okay. I have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Yuvraj, Sundar, is it possible to give us the length of the tear in your MRI mm -hmm. finding if requested for? Um, sometimes it may not be because this is not always a straight line. Sometimes it may, can be irregular and curvilinear. So, and so may not be most of the time. But we don't measure most of the time. I have not measured at all. Also, the MRI I have taken in certain gaps. So we are missing those gaps also. So that's mm -hmm. why may not be able to measure whole length of the tear. So, Amit sir, I have a question to you. Uh, how have you ever predicted the repairability of your meniscus with the MRI? Uh, but uh, there are certain types of tear which I feel that uh, can be repaired or repairable, like um, a thick bucket handle tear. I don't measure exactly. Measure the periphery. Measurement is not uh, always right. In some portion, it can be a central, and then the uh, longitudinal tear can go to periphery and come back again to the cent uh, central. So that is not. I do not base my MRI. I do not base uh, my repair on MRI. Rather, it is all arthroscopic and some other uh, parameters of the patients. Okay, Sudip sir. Uh, how common is that uh, you have been diagnosed, uh, the, you, you, you get reports like this is a longitudinal tear and when you go in, you get some different type of tear. How, how common is this scenario in your practice? Uh, many times uh, it is uh, reported as a, many times, actually many times it is not reported as a complex tear. It's a long, sometimes it's reported as a longitudinal tear. But when we go inside, mm -hmm. it becomes a uh, complex tear. So I don't have the okay. Quite often we get a uh, complex tear, which is uh, uh, not repairable. So does MRI guides you for for a decision making the repair or excision in your practice, sir? Not really. Usually so when I go inside, then I decide on table. 
uh, whether it's repairable or not. Okay. Okay. The, the main uh, aim of keeping this uh, slide and a slide is to show our radiologists that there are a few things that decides the repairability of meniscus. And this is what clinician requires the location from the periphery because it determines the vascularity of that lesion and the size of the tear and the types of the tear because radial tear and uh, radial tear and other complex tear has very bad prognosis whereas the good uh, longitudinal tear has very good prognosis and along with cartilage lesions if there is associated cartilage lesions then the repairability becomes uh, uh, drastically reduces so this is what the clinician requires and i think uh, you have to add something in your reports like how far is this from the periphery and what is the actual uh, type of tear and what is the size of tear? Okay. Anything to add, sir? Bakshi Yubraj, you want to add more? Bakshi Yubraj, I think he's not there. Okay. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's okay. Fine. Okay. So these are various... Uh, slides that shows how uh, exactly the types of tear can be mentioned in uh, MRI reading, how it looks in various types of tears. So this, I, I'm going fast because of time constraints. And okay. And one thing I <clears throat> wanted to mention is never ever uh, miss the axial films because axial films may be doing very valuable uh, images that shows the exact type of tear. Like in this picture, the left side shows the good radial tear and right side shows the buck bucket handle tear. If the images are taken in very uh, thin slices, these axial images can actually pick up the size of the type of tear. I think both of our radiologist colleagues will agree on this. Right, Sundar? Uh, definitely. And, yes. Uh, we will, we will, can you can you uh, go to view option and adjust because the pictures are completely obstructing your slides and a lot of comments comments are coming. Go to yeah, view yeah, option and fit window because it's all obstructed. View options and then I cannot see it. Minimize your panelists uh, pictures. Okay. You can minimize the panelist uh, pictures of all. Yes, yeah, so single. It's... Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, okay that's it. So let's so, continue. So regarding uh, the actual uh, view, uh, sometimes yeah. it may not be uh, easy to obtain the good picture of meniscus in actual view as well. But if it's available, definitely it will give us idea regarding the actual tear of the actual pattern of the tear of the meniscus. Since we are looking the okay. Uh, meniscus from the surface now in the axial view and we can definitely categorize whether it's a uh, radial tear or whether it's uh, longitudinal tear or whether it's flat tear by looking at the axial tear okay, sorry axial images okay. and if we are in doubt we can ask uh, our technician to take thin slice uh, of the axial images through the meniscus <laughs> only. So by obtaining those thin slice images we can uh, have clear picture of all those uh, meniscus, and we can definitely diagnose the pattern of tear by looking the axial only. Okay, okay, that can be done. So, as Dr. Sundar, I want you to take this case. This is case number three, 29 years male. He is relatively young with history of twisting injury, right knee joint. He had pain and swelling uh, with the limp, means he had uh, this is the scoring system for severity of knee injury. That is one. And he had history of knee injury during football game six years back when he had significant knee injury. There was rapid swelling. There was He was very, very painful. And MRI done at that time showed partial tear. So he resumed playing. And uh, that then in, at that time, he was managed with, with bandages and analgesics. Uh, so he sustained injury again. Injury again. And now this is the clinical picture. So... I would like you to read this image. What give me just the diagnosis? So we can see there is a ACL is not visualized completely, so it's a complete okay. ACL tear, and we can also okay. see the uh, fragment of the meniscus uh, in the intercondylar nerves, giving the double PCL sign. Uh, 
uh, okay. we can see in we can correlate this finding in so actually this portion of uh, lateral portion of the coronal image is not well visualized but in the visualized portion we can see the body of uh, lateral meniscus is thin out and we can see some flap uh, over the intercondylar nuts so this is actually a complete acl tear with a bucket handle tear Okay, you you mean to say the double PCL sign over there, right? And the previous yes. image. Okay. Yes. So what are the signs you look for uh, in bucket handle tear? So one of the most important sign is the uh, bucket in this uh, double PCL sign, and also in case of uh, lateral meniscus, so we know the width of the anterior and posterior horn should be equal. So if we are uh, seeing posterior horn to be smaller as compared to the anterior run, it suggests there is tear within the posterior run, so which is more common in bucket handle tear. Also, we can see flip meniscus sign in the bucket handle tear. So we can see the flip portion of the uh, meniscus may lie uh, beyond the uh, anterior run. So uh, sup suppose we can, I can use the... Uh, you can see it, I think. Okay. So uh, also we can see double ACL sign. We can see the Flip portion of the posterior horn can lie uh, adjacent to the ACL, giving the double ACL sign. Also, if we may okay. can see the increased height of the anterior horn of the uh, lateral meniscus or medial meniscus. Okay. So, if it's more than six millimeter, the height of the anterior horn of the um, uh, meniscus is more than six millimeter. We have to suspect it's uh, fragment. I mean, displaced fragment from the posterior horn. So, these all these are the signs of the bucket handle here. Okay, he's stuck up in. Am I visible, sir? Okay. It's visible. Yes. Okay, so why I included this slide is this is uh, this slide shows complete ACL tear with bucket handle tear of medial meniscus, and that can be seen as a double PCL sign. And there are many signs of uh, bucket handle tear, and like uh, Dr. Sundar has already mentioned, absent bow tie sign, some fragment of the torn meniscus that has been clipped in the intercondylar notch, truncal signs. The uh, very sensitive ones are the fragment in intercondylar notch and absent botain sign. And usually we rely upon the double PCL sign in sagittal image. So, um, Amit sir, I would like you to take this case. Uh, 32 years housewife sustained a twisting injury to her right knee a year back. Uh, she had limp index of 2 by 4, complaints of feeling of instability, MacMurray is positive, cruciates and collaterals are negative by test. This is her MRI image. Uh, can you read this image and give uh, us the diagnosis? Uh, let me try to do it. I can see that. Uh, okay. So in the sagittal section, I don't have the inter one, but this looks like a ghost sign out here for me. Yes, uh, third third picture, right? Yes, somewhere here and there. This one and this one, the ghost sign. This this and uh, I'm not able to put my this one, but in the superior one, second and third picture will show you a ghost sign. Here you can see yes. the lateral extrusion uh, of the, this is a medial meniscus, uh, extrusion of the medial meniscus. There are some osteoarthritic pictures. These pictures are very small. I'm not able to comment about the cartilage, but for me, it is a, it is a, a root tear, medial meniscus, posterior horn, root tear. So, so this is the diagnosis because as Amit sir has already mentioned in his talk, there are three pathognomonic uh, MRI signs of root tears. Root tear is a type of uh, radial tear in posterior horn. And whenever there is root tear, there is a ghost sign. Ghost sign is nothing. The meniscus is lost. A meniscus is uh, not seen where it has to be seen. That is why it is called ghost. And in upper image, second and third image, the posterior horn of medial meniscus is not visible or very partially visible. That is the ghost sign over there. And in the coronal image down, the second 
third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, it means you can see the medial meniscus extruded out of the joint. That is the uh, extrusion, medial meniscus extrusion, and that is the sign of the uh, meniscus root tear. And many of times, as Amit sir has already mentioned previously, five to 10 years back, these were never diagnosed. These were never diagnosed in MRI and never diagnosed in arthroscopy. And patient used to continue with it. And one of the main problem of root tear is this is a radial tear and radial tear is as good as complete meniscectomy, total meniscectomy. So there is rapid progression of osteoarthritis. So if diagnosis in time before progression of osteoarthritis and if these meniscus are repaired, all those process of osteoarthritis can be uh, stopped and can be uh, controlled. So this is the reason why I mentioned this slide. And this is uh, break in the root, ghost sign, and meniscal extrusion, the three typical signs of the uh, meniscus root tear. This is some animation which will show that if there is good root, what happens? The, uh, the weight bearing leads to the inward migration of the uh, meniscus because of hoop stress, and there will be good shock absorption from the meniscus so that there will be less force transmission to the cartilage underneath. But when there is root tear, what happens is the weight transmission leads to the extrusion of the meniscus, thus leading to over stuffing of the forces over the medial joint compartment, which will lead to virus and lead to future osteoarthritis, early future osteoarthritis in this compartment. And these conditions, if diagnosed early, can be repaired and can be diagnosed early. So let's have some discussion on posterior cruciate ligament. The posterior uh, cruciate ligament. Vivek, yes, sir. Vivek yes. can I have one yes, question, sir. Amit? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. In his presentation, he had mentioned for the ramp lesion and the root tear, the sensitivity is less, very less in uh, MRI, uh, whereas uh, the MRI findings are quite uh, clear in with these findings. So, uh, can he little elaborate by why the sensitivity is less? He has mentioned both in ramp lesion and in both in root tears. So, uh, uh, so for ramp lesion, it is a meniscocapsular junctional tear. So what happens if you extend the knee, the meniscocapsular junction comes up. If you flex the knee, mm -hmm. then your capsule goes back. So unfortunately, we do not have a device in which you do a MRI in flexion of the knee. So in extension of the knee joint, these meniscocapsular junctions are reduced to its place. So that is the reason why the sensitivity is less if it is a it is if it is a ramp tear. Uh, as far as the root tear, I didn't say that root tear is less um, sensitive. For in our study, we found that root tears are very less reported because many of the radiologists probably they are not aware of this condition. Uh, and then features are very subtle. But nowadays, if you compare what was there, the reporting of root tear two years back and two years now, the root tears are very nicely and very commonly reported. But the ramp tear is still a clinical as well as the arthroscopic diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Sundar, um, this, this is some slides about the where the posterior cruciate ligament can be seen. Uh, how common is posterior cruciate ligament? How commonly you report posterior cruciate ligament here in your practice? It's not so common as compared to intercruciate ligament. Uh, however, we okay. do see a few cases of the PCA injury as well, but it's not so common as compared to other injuries within the knee. So when you report PCL tear, what are the basis of your reporting? Uh, what are the uh, signs you see in the MRI? So basically, as compared to ACL, the, uh, the signal density of PCL is uh, very much uh, dense and very much dark, so which help us to uh, diagnose the tear within the PCL. Whereas in case of ACL, due to uh, intermingled fat and synovium within the ACL fibers, uh, it may be difficult for us to say partial tear sometimes, uh, or grade one or grade two tear within the PCL, ACL. Whereas in case of PCL, so okay. due to this, it's uh, homogeneous, low signal density, it is uh, uh, easier for us to say whether it's, there is a uh, tear or not. But in contrary, in many studies, uh, we can see uh, the findings that uh, 
uh, the tear within the PCL is underreported in MRI as well. So what we have to see okay. is the contour of the PCL as well as its attachment site along the femur as well as the tibia. So whether mm. they are continuous or not and the morphology as well, as well as the thickness of the PCL. So if the thickness of the PCL is more than seven millimeter in anterior posterior dimension, we have to suspect PCL tear despite the signal intensity might be dark in that case as well. And I want to highlight uh, in this case, uh, while looking for the ACL and PCL, sometimes we may get false impression from the uh, these fat side PD images. In that case, we might need the T2 image. So if we see alter signal intensity within the T2 image, then we can say definitely there is tear within the PCL. So how common is uh, that? How common is that the chronic PCL tear? What we what we know as a clinician is the chronic PCL tear, it uh, it heals on itself. But what happens? It it heals in wrong position or it, it heals in elongated position. So clinically there is problem with these conditions. How common is that you report a case uh, which has been sent to you with a clinical diagnosis of PCL tear, and you see good well from PCL uh, shadow over there. So we commonly see those things, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, the more signal intensity of PCL may not change in this uh, fat set PD image. So in that case, we have to look for the T2 image as well. So even in T2, uh, if the signal intensity is low, but the thickness of the PCL is more than seven millimeter, we have to suspect it's tear. And also okay. if PCL injury is associated with the other injuries as well, so the combination of the multiple ligamentous tear as well as meniscal tear. So those might also help us for diagnosis of the PCL. So uh, I would like to ask Amit sir, perhaps uh, you, you are the one with the highest number of exp highest experience on PCL surgery here. Uh, what is your take on uh, reporting of PCL tear in MRI, in acute setting and in chronic setting? So, so Vivek, rather than acute and uh, chronic setting, I'll divide them as a isolated PCL and associated with the multiple ligament injury. In, in mm -hmm. case of multiple, multiple ligament injury, PCL are very consistently reported and the sensitivity uh, and the reporting's uh, value is very, very high in case of multi-ligament injury. Uh, whereas okay. if it is an isolated PCL tear, for isolated PCL tear, probably this is a clinical diagnosis which is more important than the MRI diagnosis. Uh, because uh, if you understand the anatomy of the PCL, it is very well guarded by the anterior uh, ligament of Humphrey and the Risberg uh, ligament. So these are also very strong ligament. And if you understand the anatomy of PCL, this is intra-articular but extra-synovial. So it doesn't get resolved by the, uh, by the synovial fluid. So if there is a PCL tear rather than the hemarthrosis, there will be an extra vasation of the blood. So hemarthrosis will not occur. So resol resolution of the of the ligament that usually occurs in case of ACL is not there in case of the PCL. And because of the presence of ligament of Humphrey and the RISPR, these ligaments remains intact, almost intact. So that is why there is a high chance of misdiagnosis in the, in the MRI. For me, isolated PCL is a clinical diagnosis rather than an MRI diagnosis. So what is your mainstay of uh... What, what is the main deciding factor uh, in PCL, the isolated PCL or maybe the combined PCL with other structures injury? How will you decide whether this guy will need surgery or not? So, what is your, uh, yeah, unlike ACL, these uh, patients with PCL, they do not come with the classic instability features. They come with the patellofemoral arthritis, anterior knee pain. Some may come with the, with the instability feature if it is an isolated PCL. So a symptomatic isolated PCL, uh, exactly. even grade 2 and uh, grade 3 PCL is always a, a grade 3 means uh, not uh, MRI grade 3, but it's a clinical grade 3. When there is a more than one centimeter of the posterior displacement, uh, this is a surgical <laughs> indication. So there is an MRI grading so, of PCL and there is a yes, clinical sir. grading of PCL. I use a clinical grading in case of PCL. So do you rely on stress X-rays? Sir, there has been given utmost importance on stress X-rays about the uh, for PCL decision making in PCL surgery. <clears throat> uh, for for symptomatic patient, no. If someone who is symptomatic, 
and the clinically i have uh, diagnosed uh, as a posterior drawer test and the sac sign and the you know posterior lacrimal test and the patient is symptomatic i don't need a um, i don't need a stress x rays for those patients who are very young still asymptomatic and we are in doubt either to go for surgery or to plan a conservative treatment in these very selected group of patient i do a stress views it is not a routine uh, for me so i want to throw these questions into the all panelists uh, all the seniors navin sir rajiv sir vinod sir uh, do you routinely do stress x rays for decision making in your pcl surgery even uh, chandra sir rajiv sir No, or, Vivek. No, I, yes, I, I do no. not do. I do not do routine uh, about stress views for PCL surgery. No. Okay. Any reason, sir? But literature has said that uh, PCL for PCL surgery, uh, the stress factors are very good for decision making. Any reasons? Is it no, so cumbersome? If if, huh? if if isolated PCLs, I do not operate. Okay, isolated PCLs. Okay. Now, if okay. let's say the need surgery then maybe that's the time i will do a stress view to decide if the patient needs surgery that's the time i will take okay. a stress view okay okay binod sir dr binod sirson yeah uh, vivek as dr rajiv said i also uh, do not do routinely the stress x rays but sometimes when you are when you have a doubt especially in asymptomatic patients then a few a uh, few times i do it but most of the time i rely on my clinical judgment okay so um, there has been um, it has been shown that if you delay the mri of uh, pcl torn uh, knees for about good uh, good few weeks like 6 to 8 weeks or more, 3 months what happens is it heals on itself and the chronic pcl tears uh, we cannot make out the pcl signal will uh, look like normal so Uh, in chronic PCL tears, it is not the MRI that is uh, that good in decision making for either the patient will need surgery or not. And literature says that uh, the PCL stress views are very very important uh, for decision making in uh, PCL surgery. But having said that, the stress, the PCL stress views being taken in very good view. Uh, with perfect lateral view in perfect position is very very stressful and very very difficult and that is why it is though it is so much uh, scientific it is not so much practical and not so much accepted by the uh, the clinical community and this is these are the interpretations of the uh, knee stress views for uh, yes sir sir would you like uh, amit sir You want to no, add something? No, nothing there. Okay, okay. So oh, Vivek, Vivek, I want to add one thing. Isolated. Yes, sir. Come in, sir. Please, please, sir. Yeah. Isolated PCL injuries. Uh, okay, almost every time we treat conservatively, but very few, rarely. Sometimes what we get, patient continue to have anterior knee pain, and you when you do the posterior uh, draw mm -hmm. test, the posterior draw test is positive. and that situation you are sometimes in delima and at that time probably the stress x ray is one of the very important tool to deciding for surgery so maybe one or two mm. cases i have done of course it is cumbersome but one has to go to the x ray technician teach them exactly how it is being done and if it is more than 10 mm displacement then that was the one of the indication for surgery i suppose okay exactly yeah. so we have some uh, more slides on plc and pm uh, medial side of the knee Uh, can we continue or uh, we we we, uh, we should stop it uh, um, isor sir we have already passed two hours i think yeah i think we are pretty much over the time i think we should be you know like try to wrap it up okay uh, let's stop here so i think yeah yeah okay so i will i will show some uh, pictures how to recognize these structures and then we'll stop right sir is that okay sir okay yeah right. okay So, PLC yeah. or yeah. yes, sir. Uh, lateral corner was called the dark side of the knee because these were not easily diagnosed in the past. But this was because 15 to 20 years back. Now we know the posterolateral corners. These are the various structures: the fibular collateral ligament, popliteus tendon, and popliteus.
fibular ligaments are the main static stabilizers in the posterior lateral corners. And posterior medial, medial and posterior medial corners, medial corners, medial side is MCL and posterior medial corner is formed by the semimembranous expansions and the posterior oblique ligaments. This can be very well seen in MRI. And these are the various uh, clinical and the schematic diagram of medial side of the knee. These are rarely injured, uh, isolated. So this is the red arrow shows this shows this is the superficial MCL that goes all the way from medial epicondyle to uh, almost about six to eight centimeter below the joint line. And this is the MCL and uh, this is superficial MCL. And in lateral side, what we can make out is we can uh, imagine a man, uh, the face of the man seen from the lateral side. And this is the pop uh, ten, uh, structure that goes from pop popliteal hiatus to the mid uh, lateral meniscus that is the popliteus tendon and just that man the the the, the some something ligamentous structure goes from the forehead to the fibular head that is the lcl so these are uh, the normal uh, lcl plc structure and mcl structure but having said all this the all structures like pol uh, and P pol and popliteal fibular ligament may not be visible in MRI, I think our radiologist colleague may agree uh, with me in this fact. Uh, Dr. Yubras, can we identify all these structures like post uh, popliteal fibular ligament, POL, arcuate ligament complex, all these things in MRI? Yeah, most of the time I could get this popliteal fibular ligament, but other arcuate ligaments, because they are with this capsular attachment, so it is difficult. And posterior so, oblique so, ligament so, also we can, yeah, in posterior medial corner we can see. So these are main structures which we must not uh, forget to see, right? Yeah, this uh, popliteal fibular ligament, yeah, this is one of the important ligament. We have to uh, find and report also most, yes. Because there is okay, so the genucular, lateral genucular artery. So we, if we follow that uh, artery, then we can see the popliteal fibular ligament as well. So, but so, most of the time this, uh, uh, arcuate ligament, it is difficult to identify separately because it is attached to the capsule. That's why it is difficult. Okay. So that was the normal picture. And this is the mm -hmm. abnormal picture, the pathological picture. The MCL has been torn from the mid substance and this is retracted towards the superior side and inferior side. Uh, in the second picture, we can see that. And this is uh, even the PLC, the LCL seems to be injured and there is signal intensity change along the popliteal hiatus. So this is uh, indicative of the PLC injury. This is normal image again. The uh, LCL and popliteal tendon can be seen in inferior images and the uh, MCL can be seen uh, very pristine in the, the lateral uh, uh, the, uh, images uh, below. And this is the image where we can see both of these things. And this is again the image where the uh, the second image, second second row, second image, we can see the uh, LCL has been injured from the femoral attachment site. And this is the MCL injury, the uh, maybe grade two injury from the uh, medial side. So these are various images what we can see uh, in the uh, uh, MRI of the pop, pop, uh, this these are the stress x-rays and we'll skip this and what I wanted to mention is never underestimate x-rays because x-rays can give the value valuable information like various uh, avulsion injuries and sometimes uh, the anteromedial or anterolateral depression fracture may be indicative of the very uh, very uh, complex injury inside the knee, like this anteromedial uh, depressed fracture over there, which is seen in the CT, uh, is, is always associated with PCL and PLC injuries. And never forget to see the uh, cartilage. Uh, uh, cartilage, never forget to see the axial image for the cartilage injury when you see the MRI image. So this is, again, the repetition of slides from the uh, Amit sir stock. And whatever progress is there in MRI, field of MRI, whatever progress is there in modern, modern advances, never ever depend upon entirely upon these MRI images. You should 
amalgamate both your clinical practice, your clinical examination and MRI findings. And don't be idiots like this. So thank you so much to all our panelists and thank you so much to all our delegates for the patient hearing. Thank you so much. Sunil Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it was a very nice two hours, but we overshoot the time. And I especially want to thank the our radiologist colleagues for giving the time and the sharing with us their expertise, their feelings, their thought. It was a good experience. Uh, uh, does uh, uh, Sailas want to say something and then wrap up? Um, I think I just have to say thank you to all the panelists and the lovely presentation by Dr. Yuvraj and Dr. Amit. Very, uh, it's really good for an update for everyone, I would say. Um, and um, uh, the discussions were very good. I'd like to thank Vivek. He's worked a lot on getting all this organized. He's been always very proactive in that, and uh, I'm sure we can continue with the next uh, session that will, will be uh, coming along later. And just to let everyone know about the ACL, but we will uh, uh, let everyone know when the time and the date is. Um, and thank you so much. I think we should wrap up now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Goodbye, everybody. See thank you, you very time. much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.